Tonight's episode of the Tuesday Night Cigar Club is brought to you by Drew Estate. Come experience the rebirth of cigars at www.drewestate.com and download the free Drew Diplomat smartphone app today to discover nearby retailers, RSVP to special events, redeem points to win exclusive Drew Estate merchandise, and much, much more. Good evening, brothers and sisters of the leaf. Coming to you live once again from, well, all over the fucking place. It's the Tuesday Night Cigar Club. Tonight, the boys congregate via live video. Thanks, coronavirus, you giant, never-ending asshole. To talk their way through the cinematic oddity that is 1983's Grizzly 2 Revenge. And I'm sure George Clooney, Laura Dern, and Charlie Sheen would like revenge on whoever unearthed this cursed creature feature from their collective pasts. Anywho, our favorite crew of inebriated dumbnuts will also be smoking the Wild Hunter Maduro Cigar from Oscar Valadares, paired with a mountainous amount of tasty craft beers. So sit back, folks, light them up, and enjoy the show. Let me warm up my podcast hands. Take a sip of my podcast serum. Ah. Well, boys, we're going to revisit the creature feature genre tonight. Once again, we'll be digging our claws into a grizzly bear film. Here we go. <laughs> our claws. Oh, all right, I get it. I can't believe I haven't asked you guys this before. As many creature features as, as especially, we've already done two bear movies. Uh, have any of you ever had a life and death encounter with a wild animal? No, I had a I had a puma track me one time. Really? Yeah, me and my dad we were hiking down in a canyon in Big Ben, and uh, uh, I, I was look up, I looked up on the canyon ridge, and there was a cougar, a little mountain lion, just tailing us. He told us for a good 30 minutes, and Dad was just like, don't worry about it. If you don't hurt him, he won't hurt us. He's like, all right. But that's the, a, close, that's the closest I got. Was it a puma, a cougar, or a mountain lion? You said three animals. Uh, I think it was a jaguar. <laughs> it certainly makes for a better story. <laughs> I didn't know they had jaguars in Big Bend National Park. I didn't know they had pumas. No, no life or death occurrences. Um, being a golfer, uh, I've played on some golf courses where uh, you get to areas surrounding the woods and rather large water hazards. And so I have seen um, one of the coolest things I saw was I actually saw a fox once uh, in the woods, but they're not they're not going to come near anybody. Yeah. Um, I have when I've been by water hazards, I have seen. Uh, either right below the surface or slithering along the embankment, what is unmistakably a poisonous snake. But, oh yeah, you know, they they keep their distance too. If you know they're uh, most of the. Uh, I, I saw once, and I, I think the grizzly bears might be an exception to this, but I was watching one of the shows on the History Channel called like Monster Quest, and um, it was in Texas somewhere uh, where they were going after the, the javelinas, the, the wild boars. Yeah. And 
they had showed a picture of a hunter that had, that had shot one that was like the size of a horse. You know, it was this giant thing that looked like something from a monster movie. But they had the so-called Javelina expert on there. And, and uh, he was basically saying, like, there are giant hogs. There are, you know, giant snakes and gators that, that you know. But he said the, the reason they get that big is because they don't come into contact with humans because otherwise we kill them. So they're like, that's why... If you go into the inaccessible part of the Everglades, you might find a 16 foot long alligator or a 15 foot long python or whatever, but you have to go there because you're, you're generally not going to find them in areas where people regularly trace. Yeah, the key to their longevity is avoiding us. Right. Uh, what about you, Yaks? You ever come face to face with a, a dangerous predator? No, I have no, no, no life and death situations for myself. Well, yeah, I, of I, course, inflict death upon animals because i do hunt but. yes of course um well it's funny i was gearing up over last week for tonight's show and we had a zoom call this weekend with all my family members uh everybody's really missing each other so you know some of us don't live that far down the road in austin and we haven't seen each other in a year now since all this started almost right so one of my cousins was like, hey, we should do a Zoom and just see everybody's faces. It's so much better than emailing and texting. And and uh, so we set up this this huge Zoom meeting, aunts and uncles and and uh, cousins. And uh, it was it was really good. But uh, I asked my aunt and uncle how my my cousin Sam, you know, Sam, my um, doctor, uh, Brett and Patty's son, Sam. Yes. Um, he, he moved out to Washington State. Uh, a couple of years ago and I asked how he was doing and they just kind of shook their head and like, Oh, he's fine. He uh, got into a pretty intense altercation with a mountain lion last week and he's lucky to be alive. And I was like, we should zoom more often. Like I, I had no idea, you know, it's my cousin. I was like, what the hell happened? Uh, he and his wife bought a bunch of land out in Washington. It's just acres and acres of undeveloped land. And they've been going out there and trying to clear it a little bit, but it is literally nothing around there. And they were out there doing some work. And all of a sudden this huge mountain lion walked right up to him and started growling. And apparently it was quite a standoff, like 30 minutes plus standoff. My cousin was waving an ax at, he said, if he took his eyes off it for a second, it would, oh, yeah. Little, yeah. It would, it would move a little closer. So his wife's going crazy trying to call the cops, but the cell phone reception sucks. It's just like a horror movie. He's my cousin's kicking dirt at it. That seems to keep it kind of at bay. And finally, like it's it, things are really getting bad. He throws his axe at it, and but he I guess he had a, a something else, another big tool or something that he could grab. He thought if he threw the axe, maybe he'd hit it. If not, maybe he'd scare it. But he had another, you know, pseudo weapon handy. But eventually the cops found them and or the game warden, I guess, found them and and uh, and helped him out. But he was like, man, they they were terrified. You know, they're from Austin. They don't, they're not used to dealing with this kind of stuff. So I was like, oh, what? I was like, you know, we, we watch so many of these creature features, man versus nature. And I've never actually I know so few people that have actually battled like a an animal. I was like, yeah, I might be able to use that story on the podcast. And then. My ten-year-old, who's sitting there next to me on the on the Zoom, she's in my little square. She's like, "Oh, that reminds me, Dad got into it with an animal the other day." I'm like, "What's she talking about?" And then she keeps talking. I'm like, "Oh, sh shut up!" She's like, "Yeah, he was trimming tree branches uh, in the front yard with a chainsaw, like this really long chainsaw." And all of a sudden, I heard a scream, and I ran outside. I thought it was Mag. Or she thought it was my little four-year-old daughter screaming. Uh, I had chubbed down a tree branch, and simultaneously, a squirrel and a bird nest <laughs> fell down on on top of me. Uh, the squirrel missed me, but the the, the bird nest fell on my head. And uh, I guess I I thought it was a very manly, you know growl of of anger and 
and so it's but apparently i sounded like a four-year-old little girl screaming from a, a squirrel in a bird nest and uh she she felt like sharing that with the entire family and and now i'm sharing it with you i, I guess what i'm saying is tut you have your your puma and your jaguar doctor your snakes uh it was a pretty intense bird nest man yeah yeah and you know you know if you mess with that bird nest those mama birds come and looking for you that is correct i've, I've heard that they do that I, I've, charles bronson style she's not going to stop Every day I go out that front door and I, to get the mail. I look around. Hey, tonight we're going to learn what happens when a mama gets pissed. Well, remember, Cade, uh, a long, long time ago when uh, I helped you move from Florida back to Texas, uh, you and I did kill a pterodactyl that emerged from the the it, it was the Louisiana swamps. That bird flew out of the swamp. It had the biggest wingspan I've ever seen in my life, and doctor just plowed into it with the U-Haul. <laughs> I, I, there was no avoiding it. It, it actually it committed suicide. It killed itself on the on the mom's attic up there above the. It was either him or us. Yeah. Oh shit! You don't think it could be one of those birds that I destroyed the nest? Well, I'm thinking that you and I aren't friends of the birds. I'm thinking that that's that made its way through the whole bird community. And I think it was a red bird nest. They're, they don't. They can't hurt me, right? <laughs> right. I mean. I don't know. I feel like every time I'm outside, I get looks from pigeons that they know who I am and what I've done. <laughs> I I actually told those pigeons who you are and what you've done. I'll stop, though. I'll stop. I know a few red birds around here. I can spread a word to myself. Oh, Jesus, where is this going? Welcome, everybody, to the Tuesday Night Cigar Club, episode 131. Yes. 131. 131. It's our uh, second show of the year. I'm very excited to be here. Good to see you guys. Everybody looks healthy and happy. Well, healthy. Well, yeah. hey, you guys are here. You guys are here. <laughs> what are you talking about? I'm a jolly asshole. I'm ready to go. Uh, you can be a lot more jolly after you drink a couple of those. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, what do we do every episode, Yax? Let's get right to it. I, I, I really talk fast. I want to get my mind off that bird news. I'm really freaking oh, out. Oh, it's 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 coming back. Don't worry about that. There's no escaping it now. If I leave the corner of hope tonight, you got your scent. They can track you anywhere. If I leave the corner of hope tonight, and there's a little egg outside the door. I'm <laughs> freaking out, man. Well, every episode we like to have a delicious, hopefully delicious cigar. Oh yeah. Paired with a. Hopefully delicious craft beer. Oh, yeah, mama. And then we talk about what could hopefully be a cinematic jewel. This time it's going to be about, it's going to be a creature feature featuring an enormous enraged grizzly bear. It is. It is. And that brings me to, good, good job, Yax. That brings me to introducing tonight's cigar. Tonight we are going to smoke The Wild Hunter by Oscar Valladares. It is it is the cigar that's marketed towards every dude in Texas. Uh, <laughs> it has the orange orange camouflage uh, band with the orange text. It's got an orange wrap, uh, band around the foot indicating it's the Oscuro, the Maduro version. There is a natural version of this cigar. Um, but yeah, I mean, this looks like it should be sold in Academy Sports and Outdoors, doesn't it? <laughs> I had difficulty finding it because it is camo. <laughs> well, that's why the bright orange band, yes. Um, it is a six by 52. I'm guessing that's a Toro. Uh, wrapper is Honduran Oscuro from the Copan region. Copan region. Uh, binder is Honduran. Filler is Honduras. Tuttle, have we ever done a Honduran Puro on the show before? Oh, man. Not that I recall. I don't think so. Um, yeah, I don't think so. As I said, it was uh, made by Oscar Baderes. In 2017, we gave the number 10 spot in our top 10 best cigars of the year to the Oscar Habano. 
And a year later, we named the 2012 by Oscar Barber poll our number five cigar of the year. Mm -hmm. And the 2012 by Oscar Corojo, our number seven cigar of the year. So we have a track record of thoroughly enjoying Oscar cigars, to say the least. Yex, I'm probably safe in saying that one of your favorite cigars of the last five, six years is the Oscar uh, Leaf by Oscar, Connecticut. Yes, um, very much so. These are the un unmistakable Still. cigars. They, they come wrapped in a actual tobacco leaf. You love those things. Um, and they're good. They're really good. Uh, I've actually reviewed that stick, the Connecticut uh, Leaf by Oscar, on the TNCC website. If you folks at home would like to get my spin on that one. Spoiler alert, I liked it as well. Uh, but tonight's cigar, the Wild Hunter, comes in two forms. Like I said, a natural wrapper and the Maduro. We're going to smoke the Maduro offering tonight because I thought it looked sexier. I thought the darker wrapper against that uh, orange and camouflage stood out. It just catched my eye a little bit more. Um, and I tend to like both Oscar's lighter and darker offerings. But uh, yeah, so I was like, you know what? We're doing a movie about... Grizzly bears, there's some guys in camouflage hunting this son of a bitch. Perfect cigar. What's yeah. going on with that cold draw there, man? There's a there's a interesting little deal. It's almost like a tea or a little green shading to the green side. And then there's a little bit of sweetness. Mint. Green tea and mint, baby. Yeah, that's a unique like cold draw. Almost like an Andes mint. Those little ones you get on your pillow. That is pretty, pretty neat. All right. Yeah, I got the tea. I got, I'm with you on the tea. I didn't really get too much off the wrapper itself, aroma wise. Yeah. No, there's a, a touch of sweetness on the on the foot itself. But uh, all right, you boys light up. Speak of cigars, as you light up, Doctor, you know who makes some really good ones? I do not. Well, there's a lot of them, but one of the best of the best. Our friends, our good friends over at Drew Estate. And one of the most delicious offerings in their vast portfolio is the Herrera Steli Miami. Crafted by level nine Cuban rollers at the famed El Titan de Bronze in Cali Ocho, the Herrera Steli Miami line is expertly rolled with a lavish Ecuadorian Habano Oscuro wrapper over a rich Ecuadorian Sumatran binder with select fillers from the Dominican Republic and Nicaragua. The new look of Herrera Steli Miami features a rich black and gold packaging. Looks really sharp. And is available in five sizes. Uh, this delicious cigar is now available at Drew Diplomat retailers everywhere. So go get you one. You won't be disappointed. I can feel confident saying that. Oh, and also, before we move on, while we're talking about cigars, you guys watching and listening from home should check out an Instagram page for The Blend. It's called The Blend News on Instagram. What is The Blend? It's a, it's a new service. It's a weekly newsletter. With the latest cigar reviews, news, releases, deals, and more. Um, they're also uh, alert people to new podcast episodes. They're going to make people aware of when we release a new show or if I do. All right. Review. Doctor drops a review on the website. They'll pick it up and they'll let people know in their weekly newsletter what they need to check out from the Tuesday Night Cigar Club. And uh, yeah, these guys seem to have their act together. So I want to give them a little shout out. Uh, check out the blend news on Instagram, and uh, I was just I was just talking to talking to the misses. I need to get more involved on this Instagram thing. It's it's where it's at. Todd. It's where it's at, as the kids would say. The blend, huh? The blend news. So check them out. All right. Um, Is it okay. at the blend? On Instagram, it would be at the blend. News. Okay, at so the just blend news. But they're just called The Blend. And honestly, okay. they haven't really done much for us, so I'm, I'm done talking about them for a while. Okay, bye. Later. They start, they start sharing a bunch of our shit, you know. <laughs> like a minute. We got, we, got, we got important stuff to talk about here. Um, what could be more important than talking about the beers we're drinking? Nothing. And this is going to be an easy night for you, Yaks, because you knuckleheads so are drinking the same fucking thing. And the doctor and I are drinking two offerings from the same brewery. Your workload's like 50% what it used to be. Are, are you saying that I'm not working hard? No. 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 That's, what, that's what you just said. You've been talking to those Redbirds, haven't you? It's, they, they text me a few things about you. How are they texting? 
Oh, how'd they, they get your names. how'd they get your number? Uh, the blend sent it to them. <laughs> <laughs> Why are we still talking about it? Dude, they're all tapping their phone with their beak. Uh, we're with Tuesday Night Cigar Club. Could you get us our own number? <laughs> Blend's like, you got it, buddy. Checks out. <laughs> all, all right. right. Well, you and the good doctor yes. are having the Voodoo Ranger IPA line from uh, New Belgium Brewing, located there in wonderful Fort Collins, Colorado. All right. Uh, the good doctor is having the American Haze Voodoo Ranger. Uh, it is a uh, 5% ABV, 30 IBUs. Um, they, they say that it is, uh, you'll detect notes of passion fruit and freedom. I'm not sure what freedom tastes like, but apparently it tastes like American Haze Voodoo Ranger IPA. You'll know it when you taste it. But, That's still free. Yeah, there you go. You get the passion fruit. There is a citrus aspect to this, but uh, it's hard to nail down anything specific. There is. Doctor, I actually had that one earlier, last few months, I think I had it on the show. And um, yeah, it had a really nice citrus component to it. Um, if I remember right, the hops weren't too bold. It was IBU-wise, it, it wasn't. It, it was it was not the bitterest of the IPAs, but it, it just had a it had a, a pleasant profile. That's accurate. Yeah, it's not really bitter. It's got a nice smooth taste to it, and the freedom is coursing through my veins. Uh, <laughs> freedom! I uh, I'm I'm a fan of freedom. I like freedom. Uh, what about me? What am I drinking? You your Voodoo Ranger is the Imperial IPA. Uh, it is a 9% ABV and 70 IBUs, which I think I've had it before, but I can't remember if that 70 was a, was a hard 70 or was it 70 is good. Less than. No, it's actually it's, good. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll take 70. I actually respect the hell out of it for saying 70 because it's it's got a nice a nice bite to it, um, which means most brewers would put it at 90. 90 something, yeah. Oh, you can pick up some hops? 100, 100 IBUs. Uh, no, it definitely has a, a nice hop bite to it. So I, I actually, I'll go with the 70. And uh, man, this might be my favorite New Belgian beer. This is damn good. They're saying it's got, a, it's got a strong pine and citrus notes to it. Oh, pine trees like in our movie tonight? You know what? Trees. I'm done talking. I'm done, I'm done talking. See, now I'm pairing the movie with the hot varietals used in the beer. That's like three-tier pairing. <laughs> Dude, that, no, that, that's not going to count because you could just look through the uh, – let's see, a, a movie from the south of pine trees, hops taste like pine, I'm good. No. You know who else likes pine trees? Redbirds. Yeah. Um, it, it it actually has a little bit of maltiness to it, but I guess that's the the, the high booze and the imperial. Sometimes Most that likely. that higher alcohol just kind of comes out as a malty kind of thing. But the but the IBUs kind of overshadow that. And uh, yeah, damn it, that that aroma is there's there's some pine in there. Well, now, if you if you if you want to talk about high alcohol content, then you'll have to look at Tut and I because we might not make it to the halfway point on this podcast. Our uh, our delicious Imperial Stout from the Tups Brewing Company, not Tops Baseball Cards, Tups Brewing Company. Yeah, the full grown Woodsman. It's totally out of focus. Which he is I know. right now. Much like you is twelve point one percent. Twelve point one percent. Twelve point one percent. Twelve point one percent. You look. You can see the twelve point one percent, and it's a fifty IBU. So black is. And nice. this is a. It's so hard. It it, it knocked what? him out. It he spilled a drop on his laptop, and it got his laptop drunk. It is. Oh, there we go. It is stout. It embodies the word stout. <sighs> is it good? What are you guys tasting? Uh, syrup and alcohol. Chocolate syrup? Yes. 
<laughs> maple syrup. Maple syrup. Like it a, has a yeah. little chocolatey. Has it has a touch of chocolatey to it, but not like kick you in the face with it. I like maple syrup. I don't know if I've ever had a beer that was heavy on the maple syrupy side. They're having to do that to counterbalance the medicinal quality of the beer. Uh, well, tell you, you don't you don't look so much like you're enjoying it. Um, give me about half can, and I'll change that. Okay. Uh, of course, you guys chose what is it? The grown up bearded. What is it? Woodsman. The full grown woodsman. woodsman. It basically looks like Gimli's beard from it, Lord of the Rings, which is an excellent tie-in. Oh, we he he plays a. A, a central figure in tonight's film Grizzly is a woodsman. That is a that's a great pairing. Unfortunately, if you ask great name, who's in Bouchard? Cody, are you getting any roast off of this thing? The malt profile? Uh, that one is kind of hard. I'm just like a tiny bit into this right now, so okay. it, I, I'm I'm literally getting that sweetness from the from the syrup and I and I am tasting the oak. Yeah. The actual woodsy which aspect. is actually playing really good with the wood from the cigar yeah there's right. a there's an oak on the draw of the cigar a really bold rich oakiness that uh i imagine would go really really good with what you guys have it's 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 playing nice with my my piney pine heavy ipa which i anticipate it would uh but yeah it sounds like the woodsman and by the way, that's a great pairing. The the woodsman. We have a we have one of the classic woodsmen of all time in this movie, and uh, unfortunately, Yaks, you won't get the full pairing grade because I told you about the beer and where to buy it. So you those, didn't tell me. You pointed it out to me only because of the woodsman aspect and how it would in the movie, but it had all the other stuff. The Gimli beard. Come on, you said nothing about that. I thought we put a rest here. I saw band. that. You know, Tut texted me when he's watching this film something about Gimli. Who the hell's Gimli? Wait, the, the dwarf in Lord of the Rings, played oh, by none other played, than played, played by our hero of tonight's movie. Okay, yes, I've seen the Lord of the Rings. I just didn't bother to memorize any of their names. You know what? Um, I'm out. I'm, I got to go. Dude, he was I the dude in Indiana Jones yesterday. Yes, Sala. I know that name because I like that movie. <laughs> Lord of What's the funny is I don't I don't know his character's name in Indiana Jones. It was Sala. It was yes. just that dude with because the funny one, hat and the monkey. One, you could tell it was him, and two, the Lord of the Rings were fine. It's just that at some point you're like, dude, I got a I got a life to live. I can't sit here watching a movie. life to live with Aragon. Who's that? <sighs> Listen. The Redbirds hear you. They're coming. Oh, boy. It's getting contentious already. I should have chose beer with a higher alcohol content. Hang on, guys. I got to go sniff some glue real quick. Right. Hey, real, going back to the cigar real quick, guys. Man, you nailed to that oak profile on the on the draw is really nice. Yeah. It's it's, it's not super strong. It's, you know, full medium. Um, not close to going into full territory. And, man, there's really nothing for me showing up on the retro here. Uh, there's a little bit of a, uh, there is something, it's very subtle though. It's almost like a little gingerbread, gingerbreadish. I was going to say cardboard. No. But we'll go with gingerbread. <laughs> we'll go with gingerbread. Of course, that might be the syrup that's starting to coat in from the, from I'm the beer. Egg Are you guys getting Eggo waffles? <laughs> I wish I was, because then I got maple syrup for them. Like right here, it's in the beer. It's like I got Aunt Jemima in my mouth. <laughs> I can't say that anymore, can I? She no, was, oh, no. It was canceled, right? No. Well, there's only one thing for me to do, which is make some pancakes this weekend and pour that beer all over it. <laughs> you will not you be disappointed, to. sir. I think you have to. Uh, the champions. Yeah, so uh, before we move on, the, the cigar so far, it's got a really nice uh, little stack of dimes, ash. Uh, but man, really, all I'm getting so far on this thing is just a, a really nice woodsy oak note. That's that's it. Tut's getting some graham cracker on the nose. Uh, what about you, Yax? I'm getting that oak uh, right now. I mean, it, it, I just lit up. I mean, literally, I was I 
I was telling everybody about beer, and so I. Tut, you know what I'm getting on the nose? Just got it. There's a little sweetness there. It's marshmallow. Is it? Yep. It's marshmallow. I don't do a lot of marshmallow, but you may be right. I will uh, revisit that here shortly. The third component, Doctor, (sighs) of what we do. And we do like no one else can. Correct. We dissect, to use your scientific lingo. We do an autopsy on a film. We (laughs) cut that fucker up, split it open, dig around and see what the hell's going on. We weigh each organ on the cinematic scale to see how many ounces of bullshit it has, how many ounces of drama and suspense and comedy. And we take our notes. And at the end of the show, we tell you if this thing deserves hour and a half, two hours of your viewing time. Or in this case, what, like an hour and five minutes? An hour and five minutes. Here we go. And much like uh, in the laboratory, we uh, sometimes file a report. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor, if those redbirds do get me, would you please conduct the autopsy and really be generous and leave out a lot of stuff that's going on inside of me? Yeah, we'll see. Damn it. I tell you what. Yes. Thank you. See how hard tight. See how easy that is to say yes? Well, when I remind him of the last couple of uh, pairing scores you've given him, I bet you that changes up. Grizzly 2, 1983's Grizzly 2, The Revenge. (laughs) That's okay, Tut. I'll let you grade my autopsy. (laughs) (laughs) Like your autopsy or the one you do of me? The one you just asked me to do on you. Gosh. (laughs) Astute fans of the show will certainly remember that we featured William Girdler's 1976 classic Grizzly back on episode 101. And while this sequel to that classic creature feature, that thing earned 30 million bucks at the box office. That's 15. That's twice as much as Hudson Hawk earned. That's crazy. Uh, Well, this one was shot. That is. Oh, my (laughs) God. Uh, doctor and I were talking, uh, we had mentioned Hudson Hawk last episode and he went back and watched it last night. And when he went to IMDb and was reading about it, dude, that thing only made 16 million bucks worldwide. Off a budget of 65. On a budget of 65 million. That just is proof that people are idiots and don't know what's good out there. I heard that. Man, come on. Because <sighs> that's around the same time, uh, not shortly after that, that that Arnold made Last Action Hero, which probably did the same box office. Another phenomenal entertaining movie that just people didn't get. You know? Sands me. What year was Sands. that? What was year was that? Uh, Hawk was 91, right, Doc? Yeah, yeah, of course it's the 90s. The 90s and blow. Last Action Hero was... 93. 93, right around the same time. Yeah. yeah. All those big, unstoppable Hollywood action stars kind of took their lumps there in the early 90s yeah um, it comes the undes- age of undeservedly so it comes the age of grunge and all that stuff we want to be real i'm with you Tug. i'm with you then those guys wisely went back to their bread and butter immediately well that didn't work who's <laughs> <laughs> the nice cigar club is anti pearl jam correct oh big time big time yeah, I was, I was never really a fan. All in favor? I don't want to say I'm anti, but I was never I'm going to sing the game. same song Go. again and again. Right. Do it, Yaks. Raise that hand. Yak boy spoken. <laughs> yeah. I already raised the hand. I raised oh. it up. And I put my thumb down so that it can just go down. Such a desolate uh. wasteland of music. I'm really liking yeah, the, really the show tonight. I really do. I really can feel it. I really <laughs> like it. Yeah. So surly. Uh, we're very surly tonight. That usually turns out our advantage. Uh, uh, Alice so I get James. my Woodsman X? <laughs> Allison James is pretty good. I had like yes. one song. Um, anyway, this sequel was shot just a few years later after the success of Grizzly 
but it was never released and has remained in film canisters on a dusty shelf until now. So, Tut, I told you we did a a brand new movie last show. I'm going to try to do some newer stuff. Technically, this is (laughs) technically you nailed it. Official release. This film has never been officially released before. This is a 2020 release. It's such a, it's such an odd bird story that I'm not going to complain one bit. I'm like it, this this story needs to be told. It does. This film started in 1983 and it's finishing its story in 2020. Um, we'll get to that. So what happened? You're asking, Cade. What happened? What happened? Well, we'll get into it throughout the show. Uh, I know the doctor and I have quite quite a few things we'd like to add. Uh, to the historical aspect of this production, but I'll pull a quote from a slash film. Article. Oh, not that, not that every good piece of music has a moment of chaos quote. Oh, no, no, no. That doesn't apply to this movie. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. You're not going to hear from French composer. Or whatever okay. All right. Uh, <laughs> uh, I actually found out he did an entire, he can, he composed an entire symphony around the mating rituals of the red bird. <laughs> So I'm not going to talk about that fuck face anymore. Uh, I am going to refer to a slash film article, which I thought summed up the situation rather succinctly. Yax, did I use that word right? Succinctly? You did indeed. Okay, good. The sequel was shot in Hungary in 1983, but before additional special effects using a giant mechanical bear could be filmed, the film's executive producer, Joseph Ford Proctor, or as one of his prior collaborators, Jerry Lewis, referred to him, Joseph Fraud Proctor, disappeared with all the money. Uh, Proctor would turn up later in jail for tax evasion on a totally different uh, set of circumstances. In the years that passed, uh, the film's producer, Susan C. Nagy, has become the inadvertent caretaker of the film. Unfinished bootlegs popped up over the years. Doctor and I, every time one came up on YouTube... I tell Doctor, dude, somebody uploaded uh, Grizzly to the concert. He'd be like, "Oh shit!" And dude, within minutes, it's gone. She she dedicated a huge part of her life to pulling down bootlegs off of yeah. YouTube. Uh, but as it turns out, Nagy spent the last few years finishing the film. In 2017, she planned to write a memoir of her experiences as a film producer and an artist, but she realized she couldn't finish the book unless she finished Grizzly 2. Inspired, she got to work and licensed recent stock footage of Grizzly Bears and worked with a team of editors to create a new movie titled Grizzly 2 Revenge. I wish you wouldn't have told me that she was writing a memoirs and decided that she needed to finish the movie in order to finish the memoirs. Because now a lot of things are starting to click into place. Well, her, her story is that repeatedly since then, she tried over and over again. Things just kept coming up in life and her career, but she, she kept wanting to go back to it and finish it uh, she, and just kept running the roadblocks. She forked over a ton of money in the 90s to keep those rights to the film secure, yeah. even though it was in shambles. She kept the film itself in a safety deposit box, the master print, forever. If you go, um, and I, I'll just say it now. I was going to mention at the end of the show. If you're interested in what we're after we talk about this, go to the ringer.com and read Brian Rafferty's excellent article. Doctor, can you believe a guy went this in depth as a journalist on Grizzly 2? It's gonna take you a long time to read, but all, all the facts are there. It's a it's an extremely interesting story. It is. He dives into just what the hell happened during the making of this film and the 37 years that followed it. Um from from one producer leaving with money to another producer leaving with money to um as we go through the story you're going to hear about all these insanely talented people that were attached but for a multitude of reasons this thing just was doomed to fail and i guess we'll save it till the end of the show to if we think it it failed with with Nagy's uh I was shocked because I knew a little bit about the story. I knew what y'all told me is that this was originally shot in the eighties, uh, you know, set dormant for a long time, then you know, she got got everything together, put it together and put this out. So I was like, You were like, Hey, here's our movie, Grizzly Two, on Amazon, you can rent it and I'm like, All right, cool. Went over to Amazon and it's like starring Charlie Sheen, starring well, George Clooney. 
well, starring had- Laura Dern. Oh my goodness, let's go. I had the discussion with the doctor prior to telling you guys what the movie was. I was like, should I just tell them we're doing Grizzly 2? Just and that's it, like I usually do. Or should I tell them that there is differing footage shot then and now and to really keep a close eye on it? Because one, the doctor's like, yes, you should tell them. You don't want to set them up to be assholes to where, oh, I didn't notice that. And I didn't, you know, like, you know, you call yourself a film podcaster. You didn't recognize HD 1080p footage of nature and something. Wow. Shot on. They had a vertical drone in the 1983. <laughs> but okay. the main reason I want I, I wanted to stress to you guys, Tut, not you, Yags, is so, sometimes Tut, when we were talking about film, you'd be like, well, I just kind of had it on the background. I was mowing the grass. I had it on the house. I'd look look in I'd look in the living room window every now and then and check check it out a little bit. I really want you to pay attention to because the bulk of our conversation is going to come from this this method that she used to complete this film. Man, I really wish you would have been that specific in that email. <laughs> I said watch the film closely. That's good enough. Well, yeah. yeah. Um. Well, listen, it was written, Grizzly 2 was written uh, by the husband and wife team of David Sheldon and Joan McCall. Sheldon also wrote the first Grizzly, and he was promised he could direct this one, one of many broken promises in the Grizzly uh, history. And Joanne, uh, Joan, his wife, had a supporting role in the, the first movie we did. And uh, the eventual director tonight is Hungarian filmmaker, good luck, Cade, Andre Sazots, S Z O T S, and the O has two little dots over it. Just go with Zots or Zots. Zots. Yeah, it's Zots. a Zots. I think it's Zots. Zots. Or maybe Zots. If it had the umlaut, then it's Zots. I'm going with Doc. Zots. Zots. Uh, William Girdler, who directed the original film, uh, died in a helicopter accident in the Philippines a year after he made Grizzly. So. He wasn't coming back for this one. <laughs> Obviously. Uh, kind of feel bad just, for Chuck. I don't know why that. Tut's laughing. I was just giving back. So I don't know why you're laughing at that. It's oh, the right. beer, man. It's 12%, the beer. 12% beer. Oh, no. Dude, William Girdler's grandkids are I've like, got engineering physics in the morning. It's a podcast about de- grandpa's movie. <laughs> Let's watch it. William Girdler sadly died in a helicopter. <laughs> Okay. Here's a synopsis uh, of tonight's film. See if you boys agree with that. All hell breaks loose when a giant grizzly, reacting to the slaughter of grizzlies by poachers, attacks at a massive big band rock concert in a national park. That sounds about right. Man. Yeah. That's yeah. Do yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, if you remember, at the end of Grizzly One, uh, the grizzly is blown up by a bazooka. By our hero. Who was that rough and tumble character, Doctor? What was that actor's name? Uh, Christopher George. Christopher George. Man, he uh mm-hmm. that's what it took. It took a bazooka to kill this thing. And Christopher George. <laughs> and actually, sadly, uh Christopher George was killed by a bazooka two years after the filming of Grizzly. Tut, you want to laugh at that? <laughs> <sighs> oh shit. All right. I'm going to check YouTube real quick just to. Yeah. No, we're every still going. Every time I get a sensation that. Uh, the show's got a good vibe. It's going pretty good. I'm like, it's not recording. <laughs> as far as I know, we're still streaming and it is still recording. And I think we still have audio. Yep. Yeah, we're good. Yeah. Okay, you boys are we lost Yax. Yeah, we lost Yax. He's actually dropped out. He's been. Yeah, dropped, he's been, he's uh, been yeah. coming and coming and going. Or it's just that syrup is just in his veins. <laughs> He's been dropping in and out more than Grizzly 2's financing. Oh, 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 oh man. He runs away more than Grizzly 2's producers. Oh. Before, folks, we get into the meat and potatoes of Grizzly 2 Revenge, uh, man, this is just a straight up woodsy cigar so far, Tut. Woodsy, there's, there's a hint of leather. But it's overpowered by the woods. The leather for me is on the retro. Yeah. That's all I'm getting on the nose is leather and oak on the draw, which yeah. I guess 
for for a cigar called Wild Hunter with trees and camouflage, I shouldn't be surprised by the woodsy element of it. No, no, you shouldn't. I think it's right on marketing. I just, uh, I'm a bit surprised because most of the Oscar cigars I've had, I know you're a big fan of the Superfly too, mm -hmm. are, are really complex and uh, kind of offer, here we go, Yak Boy, he's trying to get back in. Um yeah, this is the, by far so far the most one dimension, you know, two dimensional cigar I've, I've had from Oscar. Well, the one thing that's interesting is that once you start pairing it with this beer, uh, with the uh, the Imperial Stout, uh, there's almost like a uh, a dry cocoa powder on the finish. Uh, so you take your you take your 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 draw of cigar and you get your oats, you retrohale it, you get your uh, you get your nice little leather there, and then when you let it sit, when it mixes with that guitar, there's like a little dry, co uh, dry uh, cocoa on it, which is kind of cool. So it sounds like y'all's pairing might be working, complementing the beer, or the cigar quite a bit. My guess is the more I drink, the better this pairing is going to get. Doctor, I think you might be right. That's that's that is science. That you don't need a hypothesis for that. That is backed up fact. Yeah, so is your beer. Uh, complimenting the the fairly one two punch of leather and oak on the cigar well it is uh i, I gotta agree with tut the more the more of this beer i have for some reason it just keeps getting better and better i don't know why but it's it's that. weird because it's not a co-mingling of the draw flavors versus the straight up beer flavors it's the aftertaste co-mingling that where it's really shining co-mingling of that syrup in your bloodstream <laughs> yeah. that's also really shining well, keep it up, boys. I'm counting on you. Uh, surprisingly, the piney elements of my hops, uh, it's not interfering whatsoever with the cigar, but uh, it's certainly not dancing with it as well as, as you boys uh, stout. So, uh, okay. Um, we shall revisit. So, we start things off, Grizzly 2, The Revenge, with some stunning... 1080p high definition footage of nature with so two crisp, so crisp. <laughs> with two opening credits immediately executive producer Suzanne Sikos Nagy and then producer Susan Sikos Nagy uh, dude she kept the grizzly 2 torch burning for over 35 years she wants you to fucking know it and yes after, when you read the history of this film it's deserved. It, I was I about to say. Her, I don't blame her one bit for the first two credits you see on a film or her fucking name. Uh, she deserves that. And then we see the title acting credits of George Clooney. Whoa. Laura Dern. Oh, my. And Charlie Sheen. Oh, this is going to be the greatest thing ever. Well, Tut, they may only be in the movie for a collective five minutes, <laughs> but Nagy wants us to know that, too. She got, she got them. Five minutes is a stretch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm not over-exaggerating, folks. This opening nature footage of deer and birds and bears is just so gorgeous and so crystal clear. If you didn't know the backstory going in, which we kind of gave you a, a little piece of, when you're watching this low, somewhat low-budget film from 1983, you'd be scratching your, your head. Like, what? I thought this was... Man, this is the greatest restoration of all time. Yeah, it, it still it still actually got me for about ten seconds there. And granted, I was drinking heavily, but I all of a sudden I turned on. I was like, "Fucking a man, this is 1983. What the hell?" And I was like, "Oh, you dumb shit. This is the stuff they shot six months ago. This is the greatest restoration in movie history." Uh, no, but I if you, that Children of the Corn Blu-ray was awesome. If you just rented this, you would be scratching your head, wondering what the hell's going on. Or if you're Yak Boy, you'd be scratching your balls. I've seen you do that when you're confused about stuff. You scratch your balls. Why are you watching me scratch my balls? Well, Tut, what have you been doing with those birds? Tut nudged me in the shoulder like, look at, look at Cody scratching me. Uh, After a beautiful, smooth, aerial drone shot following above a motorcyclist as he stands on top of his bike seat with his arms outstretched as he zooms up a heavily wooded mountainside for some reason. Not sure what that was about. We never see him again. 
We are introduced to some poachers who shoot a baby bear cub who's climbing a tree in search of food. And the baby's parent, the mama bear, with some extremely cheesy CGI bullets and digital blood splatter. Oh, my God. This horrible. makes the digital blood splatter and expendables look like. It was quality stuff, man. Oh, this looks so bad. This <laughs> it was killer. horrible. It was so bad. But I still didn't almost, like it. For a second there, you literally see the little CGI bullet. But they showed the little bullet. There, I thought it was like, I mean, it looked actually like it was the whole bullet. Not, it was the shell and everything flying across the screen. I was like, wait, I, no. I think you're right. I think they actually did fuck up and show the whole bullet. Like, that's okay. Well, this boy's, this killing of the baby bear is what's called an inciting incident. Yeah. As it launches the action, the film that is to follow. I didn't and like I'm, it either. And I'm assuming that they never actually filmed the killing of the baby bear back in 1983. So that's why they didn't film a lot of stuff in 83. And they're kind of having to go back and fill in some holes. And if they so would that, have filmed it back in 1983, they wouldn't have had that Peter or anything to worry about. So they could have just shot that bear right there and get some really good quality footage. Well, Nagy would never go for that. She's she's a she's an artist. She's a tender soul. That's I'm assuming Proctor absconded with the money to a Monte Carlo casino. Otherwise, we might have had some of that shit. He actually took the baby <laughs> bear that was going to be in that scene and bet it on black on the roulette tables, and he lost the bear. This guy was crazy. <laughs> Even though you can do such a thing. <laughs> can you can you put animals on the roulette table? Oh, your... it's Vegas. They'll take anything, baby. Now this was a hungry cons- casino. They you can do all sorts of things yeah. if you're hungry. I once put a hundred and forty five pound coked up stripper on the bed on the roulette table and they took her just fine. Did you win? No. Thank God. Nobody won. <laughs> uh, uh, that story may or may not be true. My only criticism on this and the other incorporated new footage moving forward is why didn't they just treat the new footage to look close to the old footage and make it so it's 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 less jarring to the eye. It's so depends crazy. on it depends on what your budget is and how much time you got to do, oh, got dude, to do in it. Post, you can throw a mask on that new footage. No, some, it's actually not with some brain. Oh, come on. It's it's not that hard to make. It's a lot harder to make old stuff look new than new shit look old. Well, I'm not going to argue that. I'm just saying it's not as easy as that's that's a problem with all you fucking directors. Oh, just fix it in post. Just throw a little filter on there. Fuck that. I made a movie called Underbelly. I wanted some shit to look old and like it was shot on 8mm film. It took a total of maybe, I don't know. I do, five have, an, minutes, I do have an 8mm film filter. Five minutes, five minutes to drop a, drop a fucking filter on that new footage and look like it was shot 30 fucking years ago. It's easy, dude. No, it's I, not. It's, it, I love Tut's syrup-infused anti-director rant. <laughs> Let him have it, Tut. <laughs> Locked and loaded. Or at least half of that's true. Screw you, Cassavetes. <laughs> we then join three campers, played by George Clooney, Laura Dern, and uh, Charlie Sheen, as they march through the wilderness. You can tell that Dern's Tina wasn't expecting such a grueling trek to the big concert, as she's wearing high-heeled shoes, and rather than a canteen of water strapped to the side of her backpack, She's got a two-liter bottle of Crush Orange Soda hanging off the side of that thing. You see that? Nice. Oh, yes. <laughs> not, that Clo- not that Clooney packed any better. He's chugging on this 20-mile hike. He's chugging Budweiser's the, in- Budweiser's the entire time. Us style. <laughs> um, after passing multiple signs warning them of bears in the area, they set up camp for the night. After dinner by the campfire, Tina asks Charlie Sheen if he could pick up all their mess and get lost. So she and George Clooney can strip down and have some fun. That was an awkward scene, right? No, I thought that was very. I thought that was very nice. Uh, she was. Oh. She was giving him the out. He took the out. Giving him the out to pick up our trash and get lost, so I can bang your friend. Well, Charlie seems said well, that he agreed to it. If you're the friend, man, yeah, you, you got to do. Charlie's a stand-up guy in this scene. Hey, he's he's an affable dude, and he actually does it. Um, well, just as. Uh, George Clooney begins to release Georgie Jr. from its tight denim cave. 
a giant grizzly attacks and eats all three of them. No rock concert for them, is it? Was I the only one who, like, when it sh- sh- it went to the uh, bear perspective, I was like, oh, Laura, are we about to see something? Hold on one second. Zoom, well, I, zoom, I, zoom. Cut, oh. cut, cut. She was She was 16 in this movie. I'm I I look at these time capsules with the eyes of sixteen year old Tut, so it's okay. And it is a sweet oh, yeah. time capsule. Yeah, it's- if you look at it like that, I mean, we were we were you know eight eight years old when this came out. So That's yes. right. Yeah, but the, the footage of the bear, the the perspective from the bear is just more like it, like a creepy guy in the bushes. You all you hear is heavy breathing, like. <sighs> it's a scene oh. I'm totally familiar with. <laughs> it, it is totally. Uh, two out of the four of us in the woods watching some camp- horny campers get busy. I'm not going to say which two of us. Yax, it's not you or me. Um, but like all the grizzly attacks in this film, we see a big bear head growl. We cut to close-ups of the people George Clooney screaming, and that's it. We actually don't see any physical violence whatsoever. At least the first one showed you like a fake bear paw come through the scene. And I was just like, yeah, I could have used a little bit more of that. I'm going to tell you why we don't have the fake bear paw a little bit later. Okay. Well, look, this was officially not Laura Dern. She was acting as a child uh, as the, well, they're all kind of offspring of famous people. Uh, George Clooney's dad was a, a radio guy. His uh, his aunt was Rosemary Clooney, um, but Laura Dern started acting as a youngster. But this was her first film. She got emancipated from her parents when she was sixteen, so this was kind of her first branching out and doing her own thing. But this was the first screen appearance of both Clooney and Charlie Sheen. I'll admit, if Charlie Sheen's name hadn't been third build in this, it would have taken me a while to recognize him. Uh, the f- voice, physically, the yes, but voice. Poop. The voice did it, but I didn't physically recognize him. He looks so different. Um, but yeah, man, we we witnessed this is the first screen appearance of both Clooney and Sheen. So uh, it was just kind of cool seeing them that young. I mean, it just yeah, and wow. they both they both were very comfortable on camera. Yeah, yeah. There's a story that uh, on from Hungary on the set that Charlie Sheen called his dad Martin Sheen because he wanted to, he was going to be a baseball player. And he got in trouble at school where they took away his his baseball opportunities. And so he's like, well, I got to change gears here. I guess I'll try the acting thing like dad. And he called his dad from the set of Grizzly 2. And Martin Sheen was like, so how's it going? And he was like, this is intense, dad. This is so much fun. And he's like, yeah, why do you think I've been doing it 30 years? Like, it's it's the best. Like, Fuck yeah. So yeah, this is what got Charlie Sheen uh in uh, you know, addicted to acting as opposed to addicted to a lot of other things. Yeah, behind the scenes stories of Sheen and Dern. I can understand why he switched. Yeah. And I thought they were all really fun in it. Clooney was a natural on screen. Um you know, and that's a, that's what I really liked about the the from beginning to to where they're they get killed i mean it, it's just it it's like a beautiful time capsule i mean i didn't know that you know it's one of those things you didn't even know this footage existed until here yeah last few months and when i saw it i was like oh my god this this is kind of cool to actually see them because i mean this is before any of them did anything you know what we would think of as notable now and yeah, even this, for Sheen, yeah. Uh, you know boys next door the wraith all of that was only here in the next few years yeah yeah uh, sheen really proved his salt as an actor in the boys next door it's still my favorite charlie sheen performance but uh clooney doctor and i've seen him you know uh the killer tomatoes uh return to horror high i think uh was yeah, another uh, one three he was the one that really kicked around the longest before finding stardom hey speaking of uh doc and i were talking earlier about joyce carol oates uh, Dern did a film version of that. Was it late seventies or was it after this? Actually, you you were talking about Joyce Carol Oates. The doctor was saying that was really lame, and I don't think any of us know what movie you're talking about. But you know, I'm sure our listeners are real big Joyce Carol Oates fans, so they they can chime in. Uh, 
And the syrup has made you forget the name of the short story that you read this afternoon. Uh, where are you going? Where have you been? I think the movie was called Smooth Talker. Smooth Talker starring Laura Dern. Never heard of it. <laughs> uh, I'm going to look it up, let, you fuckers. To let us know. Um, well, the next morning in the heart of Grover Meadow State Park, head park ranger Nick Hollister is giving instructions to a small team of men. There's an Smooth enormous- talk, Laura Dern, 1985. So it was be- it was after this. Okay. Yeah, yeah this was her first kind okay. of... Yeah, I was just... Sem- just- se- semi-adult. I mean, she was 16. But, I, I just... Um, keeping everything right. There's an enormous rock concert that's going to be taking place in the park, and Nick Hollister is going to need them to fill the role of security officers rather than rangers for a while to handle the massive influx of concertgoers. They're estimating 100,000 kids are going to pour into this park for the music festival. They've never handled a crowd anything close to this size. But what park superintendent Eileen Dragon wants, Eileen Dragon gets. She's a political player, and she sees this concert as a massive opportunity to advance her career. She is essentially the mayor from Jaws. This is all about me. This is all about the concert. I'll the mayor from it. King Cobra. The mayor from King Cobra. The beer. Uh, <laughs> it's the, a character in every creature feature. It's, it's a, a mayor. central doctor. It's essential to the creature feature to have the mayor character. A local politician, somebody who stands to gain uh, career-wise and financially from this event going off, and they're not going to let anything, especially some rumors of uh, some crazed monster, they're not going to let that stand in the way. Yeah, she was like, played by the lady who played Nurse Ratchet in One Flew Over the Cuckoo. Yeah, get this: Louise Fletcher won a Best Actress Academy Award seven years prior to this movie. She won an Academy Award Best Actress, and she's in Grizzly too. We're bringing in hitters, man. Hey, they interviewed her, and they were like, "Do you remember anything about Grizzly too? Why, having won an Oscar, would you would you ever do this?" And she was like, "Simple answer: I was 50. I was too old to be young. I was too young to be old. And I got paid to go to Hungary for two weeks. There you go. Honest answer. Yeah. I'm not over-exaggerating the size of this concert. We see an army of shirtless dudes dressed in only tight, cut-off jean shorts. Todd, I know you noticed that. Oh, yeah. And tool belts assembling the massive stage. Uh, I just love I love the footage they show here because it's literally like a OSHA video of what not to do. I mean, literally, a dude is like being held like on this thing, cranes lifting it up, and all he's got is his cut off jean shorts, no shirt, and he's got those sweet '80s striped knee high socks. Just have the crane uh, hook into my belt and lift me up, and I'll hit it with a hammer. Perfect. A very smooth operator named Charlie Hills in charge of the concert preparations. He makes sure they're running smoothly. And when a young girl doesn't show up to work, he quickly hires head park ranger Nick Hollister's daughter, Chrissy, to take her place. Oh. Do, you know, do you know how to handle a phone? Both dial and push button, she says. Good enough. And this is when I just absolutely loved this film. You, Yak Boy, tell us who Chrissy is. Chrissy, Deborah Foreman, she here in, a, in another two years prior from this point would be in one of my favorite films, Real Genius with Val Kilmer. Too. One of my favorites, too. But, and she, but before that, she blew up as Valley Girl. She's Valley yeah. Girl with Nicolas Cage and the original Valley Girl. He is the original Valley Girl. But I mean, she. In, in, in but let's go genius, back to real genius. She literally gets to say like one of the absolute best lines that I just cannot. It, it kills me. I love it every time I see that movie. Val Kilmer's character, he sees her. She's playing the daughter of one of these, uh, one of the the CIA. The CIA. But he literally, Val Kilmer's character, just literally comes over, hits on her. And it's just like, literally, if there's anything sexually that I can do for you, let me know. And she, her character just looks at him and, and she just says without, she's like, skipping a beat, looks at him and says, well, 
Can you hammer a six inch spike through a two by four with your penis? And Val Kilmer's face, whether he's, whether it was, I don't know how many took, it was always just struck me as like genuine, like, ha, holy shit. I got to see this. It just cracks me up every time. What's it called? Real genius? Real genius. Oh my God. Have you not seen it? Come on. Oh, Um, you're fucking with us. No, I've never (sighs) seen it. Wait, is that the one with all the popcorn at the end? Yeah. Yes. I saw the end. There's a lot see. of things that happen before the popcorn. I, I only saw the popcorn. It is, you're, a, you're a Kilmer fan. It is a quintessential like, 80s movie. How can you be a... No, how can you be... No. How can you be a Kilmer fan and not have seen it? I never saw Top Secret either. You're no Kilmer fan. I'm out. Stripping you of your Kilmer fan in fandom. I'm not going to pass judgment quite like that, but I'll just say that you would you would enjoy Real Genius. No, I'm passing judgment. Hey, you know what? I like cheeseburgers, but uh, you know, uh, I've never had cheeseburger before. No. Oh. Sure, that's an apt analogy, but we'll, we'll go with it's it. The, it's the 12.1%. It's the 12.1%. It's, getting, it's getting to it. Uh, is that how I sound in your ears when I talk to you? <laughs> Maybe it's the headphones. Doctor, I'm going to turn to you now. Help me out here. Production-wise, the story here, as far as this concert goes, they, this concert, this wasn't them just kind of uh, get cameras in an existing festival. They actually threw this shit for this movie. All these people showed up for this movie. The thing is, the four or five bands that you see throughout the movie, that's not why everybody was coming here. They were the opening bands. There was a big, at the time, big rock band playing there that's not in the film. That's why all you see all these heavy metal kids. I was their, wondering about that. Doctor, what was the story behind this actual concert? So, and, and uh, the, they actually bring these bands out afterwards. So what happened is you, you couldn't get a lot of, you know, Hungary's behind the Iron Curtain, but they actually had close to 50,000 people show up for a concert headlined by Nazareth. Okay. Hair of the dog. Hair of the dog, Hair baby. The dog, great song. The, the Guns N' Roses would cover it uh, in the 90s on their Spaghetti Incident album. But yeah, Nazareth was Which the isn't a huge band, but you got to remember, this is Hungary right after Soviet kind of took over. So these kids aren't getting any kind of big oh, no, time they, music been under soviet control for almost 30 years yeah so so they're coming to a nazareth concert where they have to sit through these crazy bands that we're gonna see but hey by all accounts everything kind of went smoothly the cool thing i thought doctor was they had to be careful how they filmed the crowd shots because there were this where they filmed was a Soviet training ground. There were Soviet tanks and jeeps oh. all around, so they had to make sure when they filmed the crowds that they didn't get any of the... This is supposed to be in America. They, they couldn't have a fucking huge Soviet tank out there. So that kind of adds a cool little part of the story. And the, the Soviets also were obviously, as they were with everything, naturally suspicious. They were Yeah, those tanks were to control the 50,000 people that were there. Yeah, they they kept a close eye on on the proceedings. It was actually kind of a miracle they let him do it. Yeah, um, but I I love there was one quote in that article from the Ringer I mentioned earlier, where they talked to like the old bass player from Nazareth, and they're like, "So so what was this like for you?" And he was like, "We were in Hungary in 1983. <laughs> That's news to me." No, he said something like he he's was like, like, we never knew what country we were in. He's like, back, back, he's like, back in those days, we were lucky if we knew what country we were in. <laughs> they didn't have a fucking clue what they were doing. They just showed up and played to some kid. Um, well, the grizzly uh, kills a poacher named Harvey. The dude is just sitting on a log chugging some whiskey out in the middle of nowhere when the grizzly bear slaps him. 20 yards through the air into a ravine. I mean, this sucker flies through the air. Bear slap. Nice. It's like, it was, they, put it, it's like they put the actor in a catapult and shot him out. Like, it, it, was, a, it, was, it 
was, it was hilarious. He just you see the bear paw, and then all of a sudden that dude just goes flying. Ah! Dude, it was that was awesome. Yes, that was, was actually the best. That was actually the best kill of the film because we actually saw some action. Yeah. Uh, I really want to see that catapult they put that dude in. <laughs> Nobody's jumping that much. They they had to shoot him in a catapult. Proctor paid fifty grand for that catapult before he got the hell out of there. <laughs> Uh, Yax, did I use that term correctly? Ravine? Or was that a goalie? Uh, ravine would work, yes. Okay. All right. When one of Harvey's buddies, Drew, shows up and sees the enormous bear that just bear sl- slapped his friend, he jumps on his dirt bike and races back to tell the other drunken poachers, played wonderfully by John Carpenter's Halloween's top cop himself, Charlie Cyphers and the asshole deputy from First Blood, Jack Starrett. Love this dude. I wish I could be reincarnated with his voice. No. What are you talking about, Tuttle? Are you saying that I'm the only actor to graduate with honors from the James Gammon School of Whiskey Burnished? Are you saying form? I'm the only dude? The voice got an amazing voice. We would Tuttle, never ha- kill you. We would never hang out with you if you had that voice. Dude, but, well, besides, besides, you would like, I mean, why don't you back? pass me that cigar cutter before? I, no, I'm not going to hang out with a guy that talks like that. Well, but, but, but before First Blood, what was his other film of note? Blazing Saddles. Blazing Saddles. Gabby Johnson. This guy, when Tut texted me, he's watching me, he's like, holy shit, it's, a, it's the cop from First Blood. I'm like, you don't recognize many dudes in movies, but I was like, I knew you'd recognize. Dude, that dude, voice, just, man. Dude, that voice it, it immediately. But dude, even Blazing Saddles, Yaks, I always go first blood with this guy. Well, I know, but still, I mean, it's Blazing. You got to go, go get a shitload of dimes. Oh, was that him? No, that was no, Slim Pickens. Yeah, it was Slim Pickens. Okay. You almost blew my mind there. I can make sure I'm. I'm not make sure you get a little behind the ears there. I'm not drinking twelve percent beers. You threw me for a loop there. Okay. Um, it's the Tuesday night cigar club goes bear hunting. I love it. Or jackasses in the woods passing. It pretty much off. is. Yeah. No, no, dude. These guys. This is the sad part. Out of all the movies we've done, I really related us to these four drunken <laughs> hillbilly assholes more than any other character we've ever uh, delved into on the show. I could see well, Cody like setting up a perimeter, but then in the Jack Starrett voice, I just make fun of him. Hey, Yak Boy, what are you going to try next? Cheese. <laughs> Tut, if you don't pass me that whiskey, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> oh, well, you've actually said that. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's I, the technique. In that voice. <laughs> you've said that a couple times, actually. Oh, man. When one of Harvey's buddies, Drew, shows up and sees the enormous bear. Oh, I already, I already said that. Now I'm, now I'm with you guys with the 12%. I'm repeating myself. <laughs> I agree with 100% with something the doctor said after he watched the film. I would be all on board with a prequel film just following these two shit-faced numbnuts, Papas and Steve, Char- Charlie Cyphers and the guy from First Blood around the woods for 90 minutes. That's a movie I want to watch. I just like the thing called Grizzly the Revenge where the two of them diffed by an Applebee's bartender and decided to get revenge. (laughs) I ain't paying $7.99 for that riblet bladder, Harvey. Let's go take that boy outside and castrate him. I would pay three rental fees to watch this thing. (laughs) Brutus beer, my asshole. (laughs) A third dude named Luke was dead Harvey's brother, and he can't believe that Pops and Steve are immediately thinking of how much money they could get for a bear that size. Maybe $100,000 in San Francisco. His brother's been slaughtered, for God's sake. But less than a minute later, and a couple shots of whiskey, he's on board. All right, let's get some money. A hundred grand split four ways is a lot of money, boys. Not that TNCC will ever have to worry about such fortunes. Maybe we should start hunting bears and selling their gallbladders for aphrodisiac purposes. That's what I'm thinking, Cade. I think we can adopt the personalities. I think we like the part where the four of us are sitting there passing a whiskey bottle back and forth. Again, these are things we already do. We're just not making money at it. 
Well, I mean, we're not going to catch a bear sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> Wise words, Dodger. Tuttle, I ran on live bait. Why don't you go take a walk on out there in the woods about 50 yards? <laughs> Cover yourself in this ribeye sauce. Uh, real quick, uh, I'm in my starting to approach probably pretty soon the final third of the cigar. Man, I'm about almost there, yeah. Yeah, I'm into the final third. I'm trying to slow down, but I'm blazing away. I'm still going to stick with my thing. On the on the, There's a slight note that leather retrohale is prominent, but there is a little bit of marshmallow on there. It, yeah. It, it's it. You described it as, a, I think, a, a graham cracker. Uh, there was some kind of dessert sweetness on there. A little I, bit of I, sweetness, yeah. I I, I kind of went marshmallow, which is so nice because the draw is just oak. It's just woodsy oak. There's been nothing else presented to me on the draw. Have you guys got anything else? No, it's been one note, powerful note all the way through. Pretty much. I mean, it, it hasn't been bad, but I mean, there hasn't been any transition or any any change in flavor i'm fine no, I mean, I'm, it's good I'm, because it, 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 it's a good flavor but i mean it's very yeah it's it's simplistic i'm fine with that this is what i this is what i mean as long as you're upfront about it this is what the cigar is going to be this is what it's, it's going to do and it's going to do it well i'm fine with that uh, i'll tell you where it'll come into play with me when price point if if the price point uh coincides with the singular simplistic profile of the cigar uh which oscar scars are fairly reasonably priced as long as this one is um reasonable i'll be okay with that uh if i i'll admit i haven't looked at my notes in a while if if, if it's some grandiose price point more so than the other Oscars I've had, I'll I'll kind of. But that brings that brings a good question. I mean, do price transition higher? Does it have to be higher to have a higher price? I mean, no. I'm just saying that if if out of all his other cigars, which I'm willing to pay, you know, nine nine eleven bucks for, if you're giving me nothing but a really nice woodsy oak profile with a little bit of marshmallow and some leather on the nose. I, I I'm gonna expect to pay a little bit less for this. Yeah. Because I could I could go get your Superfly or your Barber Pole or your 2012 you know Corojo and get a lot of flavors for less. So if you're gonna give me a, a little more simplistic blend, I want to pay a little more reasonable price. Yeah. Okay. We'll see. We'll see. We will see. You better start tasting that marshmallow, soldier boy. <laughs> remember the bear cub shot in the opening scene uh, how can you forget because it was a terribly shot scene with cgi and it was still traumatic okay. just it was all there was, was it though yeah it was a little bear getting killed with a cartoon bullet and a cartoon yeah i guess so i guess it was traumatic if Suspension you... of belief, Cade. Well, the rangers find what's left of it. You see, the poachers just remove the bear's gallbladder and sell it in Chinatown for its aphrodisiac powers. Doctor, is there any basis in medicine for such a thing? Gallbladders of grizzly bears giving you just an immense amount of horniness and sexual stamina? I. God, I can't imagine eating a grizzly bear's gallbladder. It's going to fill you with some sort of just immense horniness. Okay. I actually don't know. Okay. But you but try. I, I would think that if you ate a grizzly bear's gallbladder, something would happen to you. <laughs> I think so. And may, maybe like a cigar, like you're, I think that's oak. You'd be like, I think that's horniness. I think I'm feeling horniness. <laughs> I'm feeling, I'm feeling pretty horny right about now. Okay. Uh, could I sell my gallbladder doctor in Chinatown and make, I am in desperate need of some cash. Could I, could I sell my gallbladder and give some Asian guys some horniness? Well, we'll let the red birds figure that one out. They're circling. I can feel them circling. Um, 
the cute scientist in charge of bear management, Samantha Owens, isn't going to be happy at all about this one bit, these poachers killing these bears. She loves bears, all bears, even 20-foot tall killer grizzlies hell-bent on revenge. She loves them all. Nick wants to hunt the beast down and kill it, not tranquilize it and relocate it, kill it. But Samantha argues that it was just following its natural instinct, seeking a mother's revenge for the death of her cub. How would Nick feel if he witnessed his daughter Chrissy getting murdered in cold blood? That's a pretty good analogy she throws at him there. You see, Samantha is the Richard Dreyfus Hooper. Hooper? Hooper. Right? Hooper. Role in this creature feature from Jaws. And when paired with Nick's somewhat sympathetic Chief Brody type, the Jaws formula is almost complete. Nick even recently located, relocated from his previous job managing visitors at the Statue of Liberty, just like Brody moved from New York to Amity Island. So we've got the Brody character, we've got the, the Hooper character, we've got the Mayor character. All that's missing is the Quint. All right. We're about to get there. Where's our Quint? It's a checklist, Doctor, and we're about to fulfill it. Park Ranger Nick heads over to check in on the concert stage construction and have a talk with Charlie Hill about the show's security. Charlie says he hired only 50 men to handle the 100,000 or so teenage music lovers. That seems dis that, disproportionate. That uh, makes no sense. And even with the addition of, of uh, Nick's two dozen dudes, Nick doesn't feel like that'll be enough. But maybe it'll be okay, he says. Some concerts... Go okay, right? He asks, and Charlie just laughs. That's not reassuring. <laughs> no. Then, when Nick asks Charlie to look after his daughter Chrissy, she's a nice kid. I'd like her to stay that way. He's not exactly encouraged by Charlie's response to that either. Look, man, Chrissy's young and cute. And she's having a ball out here. I'll and Chrissy's going home right now. I'll keep a special eye on him. <laughs> oh. and, he, and he gets that little chuckle again. No, no. Nick flees and he runs into Chrissy on his way out. And he says, look, I trust you, but I don't trust these music industry folks. So please be careful. But it's too late. She's already banging the lead singer of one of the bands. So daddy was a little bit late with that advice. <sighs> I mean, what are you going to Now he kids? has to drag them out and turn them into bear food. It's a, it's a shame. Oh, no, bear attack them. What am I going to do? So a good father so innocent. A good father would yaks. This guy just, man. He spends way too much time on that hair than he does with his daughter. That is a helmet He's of hair. He's going to kill all of these guys that touch his daughter and My call it a bear attack. Oh, no, a bear attack. My God, that guy's got Lego hair. But, uh, Chief, this guy was completely shot with a thirty-eight in the heart. Bear attack. Doc, write it up in the article. <laughs> Cody, could you please keep better control of your beer there? Your beer bottles? That was not Cody. Oh, wait, you guys are drinking out of cans tonight. Mm -hmm. Doctor, could you please keep better control of your uh, beer bottles? After discovering George Clooney's corpse along with the other two campers, Nick decides it's time to bring in legendary grizzly tracker Bouchard or the Quint of Jaws, therefore completing the Jaws formula with the essential four players needed. Gimli gonna get him a bear. Park Ranger Pete once saw Bouchard wrestle a grizzly to the ground with his bare hands, lasso it, and kill it. Yeah, he did. That's that's he used his bear hands, B-A-R-E, not B-E-A-R. He didn't actually have bear hands. No, Gimli has bear hands. Although that would be really cool if he wore bear hands. <laughs> I actually I actually thought about tonight. I looked on Amazon. I was gonna get a set of bear hands as like a you know gimmick for the show. But then I was like, how am I gonna smoke a cigar and drink beer with bear? <laughs> I'd knock over bottles with bear hands. Yeah. yeah. Almost like with your own bear hands. I was like, that's 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 crazy. And then but they were really expensive. So uh, did the Redbirds knock over that bottle? 
I'll deal with them in due time with my bear B A R E hands. You shouldn't have chopped down that cherry tree, soldier boy. It would have been really cool though if Bouchard had bear hands, like bear paws. Uh Okay. Samantha, the bear manager, is very opposed to Bouchard's extremely cool, cruel methods, but she's outnumbered. These guys want to kill the bear, not tranquilize it. Uh, Nick tries once again to fill Superintendent Dragon in on the grizzly situation, but she doesn't want to hear anything about it. She's got senators flying in on helicopters. She's got Time Magazine there to interview her about the concert. She just wants Nick to do his damn job and kill the damn bear. Take care of it. And keep it quiet. No talking to the press. What press? They're in the middle of the fucking forest. This concert's apparently the biggest thing since Woodstock, man. This is just off the Nobody, uh, Miss Dragon, nobody reads us times. What do you have to say about that? Dude, there's no press out here. Nobody uh, reads us times. Nothing must damper this concert, she says. Under no circumstances is she closing this shit down. Dude, she won an Oscar seven years prior to this shit. So hey, bad. You're an you're an actor. You go where the money goes, man. You're getting a check. Gotta go do your work. Go work. There was a there was a quote uh on the Ringer article from uh the guy who plays Bouchard. I'll never say his name right. Dr. What Jonathan John Reese Davies. John Reese Davies. He was like, Well, you know, I just done Raiders Lost Ark. I didn't expect this to have that kind of success. But I always look for something in the character that I can kind of dig into. But at the end of the day, I just like to work. I'm an actor. I just like to work. So I was like, all right, you get to go to Hungary and have some fun for a couple of weeks. Which he actually didn't because as he did, this article digs more into him, he's like, yeah, I'd go into the little village outside we were doing it and I'd buy a, a, a bunch of deli meats from the deli. And the locals would look at me with this disdain because I bought more deli meat for my lunch than they their budget allowed them for a week of food. Wow, I've actually so I, I've actually been to Hungary and it's a beautiful, beautiful place. And I, I found the people there very, very warm. But he, he, I wasn't there during Soviet era Hungary. Yeah, no, he felt he felt their needles like he's like it's the first experience I had with like the outsider here with big bucks. Uh, He's got that Grizzly 2 money uh, buying, you know, a quarter pound of salami. And uh, anyway, uh, we check in with the four poachers and they've set up a campsite next to where they're digging a massive pit <laughs> filled with spikes to capture and kill the Grizzly. And by campsite, I mean a tiny little fire and a shit ton of whiskey. A stun. Uh, they're Gar- completely- love those bear hunting. They're completely sloshed in the middle of the afternoon. They're bitching about the new head ranger, Nick, and how silly that bastard struts around the forest like he's got a stick up his butt. So, so these and actually, guys, if you're going to talk about a ranger with a stick up his butt, then you're going to have to act it out to make sure all your drunken fellas know what you're talking you. about. So they all stumble up to their feet and start prancing around, mocking Nick and grabbing each other's asses. It's literally a game of grab ass. And I feel, Doctor, am I correct, 99.9% sure that all four of these scruffy goofballs were legit drunk off their asses in the scene. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that they just gave them a couple of whiskey bottles. I, I think like there was probably like a... All right, we're going to bring him the craft services table. Nah, we just gave Starrett a bottle of Evan Williams and a couple packs of Winston's. He'll be good for a few hours. They just let us let them just sort of, all right, guys, we're going to shoot the scene. You guys are drunk. Like, give us five minutes, college boy. <laughs> <laughs> the doctor and I have actually partied with actor Charlie Cyphers. And I recognize that beautiful inebriated sparkle in his eye in that scene. Dude, he looked... The way he looked at us when we were drinking with him was the exact same look he had in this scene. Dude, Wait, Kate, uh, Charlie Kate. Cypher's the first blood dude? No, no the no. Oh, Brackett, okay. Yeah. Oh, his partner, uh, Sheriff Brackett from Halloween. First blood yeah, guy yeah, actually yeah. Has, been, has been dead for some time, unfortunately. Yeah. But uh, yeah, Charlie Cypher's... Uh, Cade and I talked to him during the day at the, the Frightmare convention. 
and uh Kate and I had bought the VIP package so we were invited to the which VIP. means you can get drunk with Charlie Cyphers at the bar yes uh so we were at the VIP party and Kate and I had these handful of drink tickets like you know if you're playing skee ball at Chuck E. Cheese and you win some tickets <laughs> yeah. have these drink tickets and we're getting whiskey and sodas and uh Cade had gone out uh John Carpenter like walked past went outside to smoke a cigarette and Cade was like fuck it I'm gonna go talk to him so Cade went outside and was talking to Carpenter for a while and I was sitting there like man I was kind of jealous like that's pretty cool man Cade's out there having a smoke talking to Carpenter we had met Charlie Cyphers earlier that day. I turn around, there's Charlie, and I'm all, hey. He's all, how you doing? He's he's two fist and he's got a beer in each hand. You know, and this is this is, you know, he's in his 80s now. This is he's like 70. He's walking over, he's got a beer in each hand. And so I had I like, you know, cashed in a couple drink tickets. And dude, I sat at this table and eventually Kate came back in and joined us. And Cyphers was just regaling me with stories while he was just knocking back beers and having a great old time. And uh, speak of the Sheen connection, Major Charlie League. Pfeiffer's, if you'll remember, played the general manager in Major League. Yeah. And so I knew I could be like a fanboy because Charlie was, we were drinking. And so at one point I was like, <sighs> he was talking about working with Donald Pleasance in Halloween. It was awesome. And I was like, man, I got to ask you about Major League because I love that movie. He was, oh man, it was great. And, uh, I'd said I asked him about Charlie Sheen. I was like, I know I heard he was like could have played college baseball, and he was like, oh yeah, he's like he could really fire that baseball, and and uh, he talked about Margaret Witten, the sexy chick that played the owner of the Indians. Yeah, and he was like, man, he was like she was just great. He was like she was funny as could be. It was like she was cracking jokes. All the guys like, man, it was a great movie. Loved loved it. And I was like, I'm sitting here just. Eventually, Cade comes back. We're sitting there just knocking back drinks with ciphers. I'll, See, I'll probably drunk in that scene. I will put the uh, picture of drunk K, drunk doctor, and drunk cyphers on the episode webpage. It was a, it was so fun, pounding down some drinks with Sheriff Brackett from Halloween, and now I know uh, the poacher from Grizzly Two Revenge. If only we had known now, we we could have asked him about the movie then. Am I the only one who thought that these at these four drunken assholes reminded? It reminded me a lot of us back in the day. Well, we could actually hang out in the same room and drink together. Yeah. <laughs> not cigar yeah. Club, it was bear no. Dude, when we were all together, we would go crazy and we would have like these adventures and like push each other and hug each other. And did we ever get up and grab ass? Grab, you know, yak boys grabbing Tut's ass. There's yeah. some photos. There's some photos. Ah, yes. Two, Two thousand yards. Oh, 2000- Is that what we did? <laughs> so now. Dude, it was 2019. It wasn't that long ago. Thank you, COVID. You don't Thank grab you. So far, it, it was years ago. Just years. It seems like an attorney ago since I saw you all four last, or all three last. But uh, anyway, <laughs> these guys just, I, I like these guys. I like these poachers. And I don't like poaching, but I like these poachers a lot. <laughs> right. so the I like these horrible. characters. Unless they're poaching redbirds. Oh, then all of a sudden, oh, now you're friends with them. Redbird poachers. I'm just the saying they were, more of these they, guys. Were, they were aggressive. Shameful. Shameful. You're right, y- Yax. They were shameful. Well, the poachers' party is cut short when Park Ranger Pete sneaks up on them. But before he can arrest them, one of the poachers smacks Pete over the head with a tree branch and knocks his ass out. The gang of idiots then pack up their shit and take off on their motorcycles, leaving Park Ranger Pete to get eaten by the grizzly as soon as he regains consciousness. Again, though, here's the kill. He screams, we hear a growl, he screams again, and he's dead. There's no special effects, there's no gore effects. I'm going to get to that in a minute, why there wasn't. But damn, uh, you, damn you, James Ford Proctor, dude! These kill scenes are so <laughs> you weak. Scene, son of a bitch, dude! The kill scenes are so weak in this film, and I'm going to tell you why here shortly. The money was stolen. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, this actually has to do with something else besides the money, dog. I'll go ahead and tell you now. 
all the close-up kills of all these actors were supposed to be filmed later back in the U.S. by the creator of the three massive bear props. His name's Nick Malley. And get this. He designed the original Yoda in Empire Strikes Back. He also designed half the creatures seen in the cantina on Mos Eisley in the original Star Wars. This guy was real deal yeah. special effects guy. He was told, dude, they spent a, dude, Proctor spent a huge part of his budget on creating these three mechanical bears. And he was told, Mally was told, once filming is complete, we'll ship those bears back to the States and you can do all the close ups of the kills and really showcase them back in Hollywood. But like everything in this film, shit went sideways. And there was a they were stored in a warehouse in Hungary that burned to the ground and they never got the grit. Dude, he spent so much time designing these bears and they never got used. Oh. Supposedly it burned to the ground. They ended up in the Russian army. <laughs> <laughs> Can you guys that was the, the uh, warehouse? No. What's it's the Pal- what's the Palestini uh, bear cigar? Oh like my the, goodness. Yeah. The Russian war bear. <laughs> it was just a, a, an extra mechanical bear. I think it was Poli- the Polish war bear. Yeah. <laughs> The Polish war war bear was actually just a mechanical bear from Grizzly Two. You heard it here, you heard it here, folks. Tuesday Night Cigar Club. The Polish war bear is a joke. It's a fraud. It's a joke. It's a fraud. It was a mechanical bear. It was made for Grizzly Two revenge. It supposedly burned in a warehouse fire. That's bullshit. She was gonna testify against George Soros. She was gonna. Talk about the lizard army. They burned her to the ground. All three mechanical dummies burned to the ground by Hillary. Google it. And if you're in the market, make fun of my speaking voice, soldier boy. And if you're in the market, my grain based amino acid supplements will keep you from getting attacked by grizzly bears. It's a proven fact, folks. Other than the deep state. Grizzly bears are the biggest threat to our salvation. Infowars.com. Sadly. It was a lot more funny or before an insurrection happened. Yeah, it was. Sadly, there's like at least one or two congresswomen who will go there and buy the bear repellent <laughs> supplement. Again, it all goes back to my theory that we're all idiots. Uh, but yeah, but that's crazy, right? The guy Especially who, after a night of jam bean and grab ass in the forest, huh, guys? The, yeah. the guy that fucking designed and created Yoda in Empire Strikes Back made three bears for this movie, and they all got burned up in a warehouse. That's that crazy. Sucks, dude. This, this film's cursed. Again, allegedly burned up. They were just not returned to him. They were told. It just sounds like a conspiracy. Bears in Russian army now. <laughs> yeah, the, that guy the, from bear, the bear is good. Hungarian <laughs> citizens saw FBI agents in Hungary in 1983 at the warehouse. It's out there, folks. Just Google it. It'd be a shame if your bear turned up burnt in a warehouse, huh? In the meantime, you can buy my zinc supplements that will protect you from the nuclear <laughs> holocaust and maybe male pattern baldness. Infowars.com. We are now treated to a very long, glorious 1080p high definition nature montage set to some tranquil orchestral and piano heavy music. Drone shots soaring above trees. 1080p high definition birds, deer, bear cubs, including, by the way, the exact same bear that was shot climbing the tree. We see that bear again. Yeah, yeah it was reused. Tree. It was is even reused stock footage. Maybe you shouldn't have recycled that specific shot of that bear you showed us killed. Uh, and it and it all culminates in a time lapse shot overlooking the vast forest where we watch beautiful, huge white clouds zoom over the mountainous region. 
for at least 45 seconds of screen time. You know when you walk into a Best Buy store and all the TV screens have the nature footage to show you just how pretty the picture quality on these high-definition TVs are? That's what we get in the middle of a film shot in 1983. It's like, oh, grainy George Clooney. Oh, brilliant mountains. So crisp, so innocent. I can't remember ever seeing anything like this before in a movie. Where the the, the 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 incorporated footage was so jarring. I, was, I figured like you, they would like run it through some kind of filter and it takes make five it... minutes, Yax. Don't listen to Tut. It takes five minutes to make this shit look old. Not everything has a filter, director boy. There's literally a sixteen millimeter filter you can put on old shit or new shit and make it look like old shit. I haven't been at a Best Buy in five years. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor, it's okay. You'll go to a Best Buy again soon. I won't. I won't. <laughs> I will say this, though. The transfer on the original 83 footage looks really, really good. It does. Dude, I watched it on my big my big screen. It looked real. The dude, the, the movie itself, the bulk of it that was shot in A three looks. The transfer is great. Yeah, it really not looks great good. enough to mesh in harmony it, with 1080p high definition footage. Get the fuck out of here. Because it's hard it, to do. I literally it's not like just when a this when that, do it with. when that middle montage kicked in. I for a half a second, I literally thought like I switched channels, like I hit major channel. <laughs> no, you thought like a. Oh wait, no, no it's still the same movie. Saber came on on your on your TV, and you're like, oh, it's just the 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 screens. No, dude, this is part of the movie. Like I said, I said it earlier. It's so much easier to make new shit look old than old shit look new, and they didn't even try. I mean, they could have run it through a crappy sepia filter, and I would have believed it. I have a or lot of issues. Oh, I have a lot it, of issues with the editing just, of this movie, uh, but I mean, there's like slow motion things, like you know, I mean, you butterflies flapping their wings, and I'm like, what? How does this fit, <laughs> dude? That that nature, that two minute nature montage. Here's the thing: the 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 bootleg cut of this film that kept popping up on YouTube was a hundred minutes long. This thing is 73 minutes long. So you actually cut out 20 something minutes of old footage and replaced it with a couple minutes of completely new, brilliant well, HD footage. You know it's what? Crazy. I feel like when you say that, I feel like we've lost like 20 minutes of sweet, sweet Bouchard, who we haven't even talked about yet. I know. I feel like I've lost 20 years of my life talking <laughs> about this movie. With Pete now dead, Park Ranger Pete, the poachers uh, knocked him on the head with a stick and then he got eaten by the bear. Nick and Samantha take a drive deep into the woods to have a talk, yaks, with the mountain man, Bouchard. 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 Who's in Bouchard? Who's featured on your beer can. That is correct. Okay, before we meet Bouchard, I know we've all been building up to this moment. I guess uh, some of you boys are getting close to the end of your cigar. Yes. yes. Todd is using a nub tool, so he's definitely at the end of the cigar experience, and I think we're all pretty close. So let's talk price point. Uh, you are, so we're, we're all in agreement. There's a somewhat sweet component on the retrohale along with the leather marshmallow gram whatever it is but we all agree that the the draw primarily remained uh with all of our beers uh woodsy oak Berry. yeah oak yes. in particular okay yeah. uh price point i'm gonna go to yak boy first uh given what i have from the other oscar cigars Man, this get and and I guess given with what they spent with bands and what we know and what I've known about the tobacco that you presented to me, I'm gonna go 
Nine. Nine bucks. Tut. Nine bucks. Man, that's tough. Uh, it was single note, but it was a good single note all the way through. It was nice, uh, yeah. I enjoyed it. Good construction. Good lasted stuff. a long time. Uh, nice aroma. Man, played perfectly with this beer. Uh, geez, I will go 10.25. Keep in mind what you've paid for the Superfly and other Oscar cars. 10, 10, no, no, I'm going down to 8.75. I'll go 8.75. I, I influenced that. Yeah, as soon as you said, keep in mind the other cigars. <laughs> Boom. All right. Well, I mean, nah. you gotta you gotta keep in mind what this manufacturer usually charges. Now nah, I'll go nine twenty five. I'll go up to nine twenty five on this thing. That's where I'm sitting. All right. What'd you say, X? I said nine. Nine fifty. Tut got it. So you guys are right right on target with this one. Um nine fifty. And please remember when purchasing some fine Oscar cigars or other brands from FamousSmokeShop.com to use our your new favorite promo code, TNCC20, at checkout. We will knock $20 off your purchase of $100 or more. If you buy 100 bucks worth of sticks, that's 20%. And if you go to Cigar Monster and incorporate some of that stuff into your order... More than likely, you're going to get free shipping. So All you get right. free shipping if you go to Cigar Monster, buy a couple Oscar cigars or whatever you're feeling on Cigar Monster, and boom, you can get a hundred bucks worth of sticks for eighty bucks out the door. And that is not a bad cigar. That's not a bad cigar at all. It's not at all. It's honestly just a little surprising to me from Oscar because he's usually uh, blends with a little more transitions and complexity. It's it's definitely the most simplistic, as Yak Boy said, one note cigar. Yeah. Uh one note on the draw. We right. got a, a little more on the nose, but uh again, uh it's a slow burning cigar. I've enjoyed it all night. And it it paired well, super well with you guys' pancake beers and with my uh imperial ipa so uh yeah go seek it out i thought i did i mean if you're a fan of that profile i mean if you're a fan of those flavors that woodsy that oak there it's it's a good cigar it's a great cigar if you love that flavor (laughs) so i mean it's just one of those weird things i mean I, i guess that's the reason why i asked earlier i mean do you price higher transition uh because i mean like if if that's if that's the note that you want i mean how do you put a price on that yeah uh, you know what it's it's a different offering from him it's it's definitely uh something that's not anything like anything else that i've had that he's offered um and i think the marketing towards hunters and all that is smart i think if you go into a humidor and you're in the south and you see this cigar with an orange camo heavy band and all that you're probably going to give it a shot that's smart i think it's just a little bit interesting because i'm not i'm trying to i'm trying to scratch my brain cells for other cigars that feature that oak wood so prominently and i i'm kind of coming up black i think there's a lot of the not that we probably talk about in the show but there are some other ones that have a kind of a singular woodsy note to them yeah um but uh yeah if 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 oak woodsiness is your jam with a little bit of something on the nose and you're willing to blow some smoke at your nose, give it a shot. Let us know what you think. All right. Well, as we left the movie, Nick and Samantha were racing to find Bouchard, and suddenly Nick hits the brakes on his Jeep as a large tree is blocking the road. Doctor's going to have fun with this one. But but fortunately for them, standing right next to the tree stump is the one they seek, Bouchard. You could tell he chopped down the tree because he's wearing the stereotypical brawny lumberjack wardrobe <laughs> of a red checkered flannel shirt. Doctor style. Doctor style. He has a thick black beard. I almost wore that exact same shirt. 
And an, I wonder if you guys are going for a lumberjack thing here. Tonight. We were. <laughs> and he's got an axe tucked in his belt. It's like he jumped off. A, he, he just jumped off a paper towel roll. <sighs> oh, look at Tut's got his uh, YouTube folks. He Tut's did. Got, oh, wait there a minute. He is. I, I, got his axe I, out. Oh, uh, but he's got, got his thing. little plastic protector on the yeah, and and Bouchard would never leave the Home Depot uh, barcode tag on the blade. Because uh, Bouchard hewed his own axe from wood and Native American arrowheads left in the yeah. Room. I, I think when you show your Home Depot axe and it still has the price tag and the barcode on it, you kind of lose some some man points. <sighs> It's right there, the handy. Price tag comes off when you use it. <laughs> oh, it's not what have, you, what have you chopped with that axe, uh, Tut? Oh, I've chopped things. I've chopped things. Lots yeah. of things. Lots okay. of things. Things okay. that you know you chop with axes. I, mean, I've chopped. Well, I know you don't do uh, fires in the home. So what do you, what do you chop? With? Oh, I've I've chopped some some uh, tree roots and. Uh, Okay. okay. Some roots, mains. Again, I'm, I'm 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 talking tough for a guy that chopped down a tree limb and got a bird nest dumped on his head and ran like a four year old girl. <laughs> I'm just saying that you know if you need me to clear some land, I've got an axe. Brand new and a and a flannel shirt, so I can I can do okay. this. Ready to go, Todd? All we need is a Coleman lantern, and we can take on the world, baby. Oh. Doctor, who is this actor playing the role of Grizzly Hunter Bouchard? The one, the only John Reese Davies, veteran film actor, most famously known as Sala from Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indian. I Jones. thought that I thought that's what he was most famous for. According to these two, it's from the Lord of the Rings movie. Well, to, a, to, to a later generation, uh, for, from the he he has the distinction of having been a principal character in two film franchises that were extremely popular and made a lot of money uh, that were quite a bit apart. He was a uh, Sala and Raiders of the Lost Ark and then reprised that role in Indiana Jones Last Crusade. But then he did play uh, uh, Gimli, the dwarf, in uh, the Lord of the Rings trilogy in the early 2000s. Um, I, uh, he put a bunch of stuff. Um, I, I enjoyed his performance very much in a, in a mid eighties movie. That was a Indiana Jones knockoff King Solomon's minds. Uh huh. Oh, with uh, David Carradine. Uh, no, that was Richard Chamberlain or rich Chamberlain. I'm sorry. And uh, a very young Sharon stone in one of her first movies. He, he just basically played the bad guy in that movie. He was great in that great screen presence. Guy that seems to have a lot of fun on films. He's done, He's done a ton of stuff over, over 40 years. Well, like he said, like you said in that article, Doc, he likes to work. Yeah, he's done yeah. some like uh, TV t- stuff too. I think it was like oh, in one, the, some of the Journey to the Center of the Earth or something well, like he's that. Also, he's it also sliders done, or something. Doc, Doctor and I have seen him in a few uh, sci-fi movie creature. Oh movie. yeah, yeah. Uh, I think he was in an Anaconda one that might have also starred David Hasselhoff. He was taught on the on the sci-fi TV show Sliders that was pretty popular there in the nineties. Yeah. Uh, okay. Guys, a, a long body of work, and uh, I really like this guy. He's got a fun yeah. presence. Yeah. Well, he's certainly having fun here. I'm going to give you a couple of his classic lines. You ain't never seen no big grizzly miss bear management. Bouchard seen one once. He likes talking to himself in the in the first third person. person? Yeah. He's got the lucky Pierre French Canadian accent. I was trying to say. I was like. Is he French Indian? Because I couldn't tell whether he was going French or Indian. Here's another one. This bad. You've got a devil bear. I like this one too. There's a saying in the forest. A pine needle falls and the eagle. She sees it. The deer. She smells. She hears it. And the bear. She smells it. And then finally. In the beginning, bear walk on two legs like man. It kill with clubs, not teeth and claws. Grizzly is a beast from hell. Doctor, did, did grizzlies ever walk on two legs and kill people with clubs? Uh, so I'm no paleontologist, so I, I can't be sure on that one. But uh, You're the closest thing we got. So. 
Uh, it's possible. I, it seems unlikely. Uh, but who are we to doubt the wisdom of Bouchard? Do you think he's a distant relative of Calvin Bouchard from Jaws 3? Possibly. Nephew. Nephew. They've both taken on big creatures. They both have taken on big creatures. You see, Bouchard is out of the grizzly hunting business. But when Samantha tells him of the monstrous size of their grizzly, the claw, mar the claw marks reach 18 feet off the ground, and its footprint sinks three inches deep eh, on whatever, the soil. Whatever. And when, when she says this, he looks over to Nick, and Nick nods, so that confirms that it's true. I love that. I love that scene. She tells him all this, these statistics, and he looks over at Nick, and he's like, she's telling the truth. And then you cut back to Samantha. She's like, really? Like, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a professor, but you need this slow-mo park ranger to tell you that I, I'm okay. Did you well, guys pick up? Sure I don't know who she is. But she's was, got the voice of one who loves the grizzly, and Bouchard, Bouchard doesn't. Bouchard, Bouchard hates doesn't the grizzly. But no, what Bouchard I, doesn't respect women. But no, what I, I no, what I do like is that he was a uh, he he wasn't respecting her. He was getting the affirmation from the dude over there. But then when when he looked at it and goes, "What's the distance between front and back?" And then when she said that, he was like, "Oh, shnike. But he still looked over at uh, the park ranger. You have got the devil bear is this true and he's like yeah he's like okay look let's be honest bouchard's been living out in the woods he needed a man to confirm what the woman was saying then he was on board but i love they cut to samantha like jesus really <laughs> i know bouchard even listening in, to a woman <laughs> even in, even in, even in 1983 she was like this is stupid like <laughs> You're going to defer to this asshole because other than me, just because he's got a dick? I've got a fucking PhD over here, you asshole. Uh, Bouchard knows that he has to come out of retirement one last time to kill this devil bear. It only makes sense to Bouchard if men who say it have penis. <laughs> <laughs> and he politely, yaks, deadlifts the huge fucking tree that was blocking the road and tosses it out of the way so they can all leave together. <laughs> it's a giant tree that he squats down and tosses. I did a little tree trimming myself recently, guys. And uh, yeah, you get attacked. were attacked by a tiny bird and scream like a four-year-old child. I tossed some trees. I uh, I think I can relate to Bouchard. Uh, I don't think he I don't think he had to deal with the red bird presence. I've never been called a tree before, but thank you. Uh, stupid fucking red birds. Red bird, you dealing with devil red birds? That's devil red birds. It's a devil red bird. I told that when my ten year old ran outside to see why the young girl was screaming, and it turned out to be her father. It was the devil red birds. Back at the concert site, construction is ongoing, and several very interesting 80s Euro pop bands are rehearsing on stage. There's 80s Scottish electronic dance group Set the Tone. There's an all-girl group who's working on their choreography. Ugh, and a band of elderly progressive prog rockers <laughs> as well. None of these bands seem like they would draw a hundred thousand kids to the middle of nowhere in America, but it was the eighties and it was Hungary. So the, these kids are just wanting to see anything other than fucking potato soup. Right. I will say this. It makes sense knowing that the Nazareth thing on the back end, because I was having a hard time. I was like, man, they put some budget into this fucking stage. This is like a daft punk stage well, set up. Before I read, before I read the the history of how they did this, I thought they just hijacked concert footage, like they did grizzly footage, like 1080p yeah. 2017 grizzly footage. I thought they just stole concert footage from weird Scandinavian concert. No, they actually put this fucking concert together. That's part of the. It's impressive. That's even more impressive. I mean, it really is. And the fact that they. 
had all these kids there that didn't revolt when they had to listen to these four terrible bands before that the heavy metal band that was coming on in Nazareth is even more remarkable. Well, I, th I think what they actually did was there's a lot of footage of people showing up. They filmed the way I read it was that Nazareth performed first. So there's a lot of footage of people showing up and gathering and they're showing the large crowd at its Zenith. And then they got enough of them to stick around after Nazareth had played so they could film footage of the other bands. Yeah. Cause there's, there's a scene with those, those terrible, that terrible all girl band and there is shooting behind her and it's a sea of people out there. And I was wondering if they actually like, you know, put superimpose them on a on a big huge crowd or something like no. that. No, no, that's all that's all real shit. Yeah, that's to me that's even more impressive that they. Just think if you told if you told a bunch of American kids, even in '83, if they they showed up and saw a concert, and you're like, okay, the concert's over, but we're filming a movie here, so we'd love for as much of you to stay as possible. Half of them are going home. You tell a bunch of kids in Hungary. That after they see the main act, they're they're staying there like, oh, we can stay, and the the army's not going to run us off and beat the shit out of us. We'll stay here all night. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll get to more of that the concert talk in a minute. Uh, Bouchard now wearing a sweet, heavily fringed moccasin jacket, and accompanied by Nick and Samantha, is placing rotten meat in his bear traps throughout the forest. Bears love the smell of rotten meat. I guess. But the film is edited wrong. Imagine that. To where we see him later placing the traps. And then we cut to that night as he constructs this huge cauldron where he boils the traps to get the smell of man off them. First, you boil them in wood ashes. Then you boil them in willow bark. Then you add some aspen and some wild grass. That's how you get the traps to smell like the woods. Yax, real quick, I believe that's the exact same recipe you use at O'Brien's Pub when making your delicious Irish stew. Is that correct? It is. It is. Exactly 100%. A lot of wild grass? A lot. So but much dude, that dude, you don't even know. But, dude, they showed him laying traps, and then they cut to him later boiling the traps like, you have to do this first. <laughs> they couldn't even edit that right. The, the, I got a lot of problems with the editing on this movie. But, but hey, well, maybe uh, he was doing more traps versus the other. Right. Yeah, he froze because the computer knew that he didn't know what he was talking about. No. Real quick, this scene, though, from a cinematography standpoint, was outstanding. That cauldron in that cavern. And the light bouncing off the rocks, like that should look great. That that there's there's some moments in this film where the sim the original cinematography looks amazing. Yeah. They originally had the cinematographer from uh what's the uh Spielberg uh alien movie? Uh uh Close Encounters? Yeah, they had that guy. Yeah. And they Shit. imagine this, they couldn't pay him and he left. He so he left. So I got another guy. But dude, that shot of him in that cauldron blowing those trap with the, the park rangers there, that shit looked really, really cool. It looked good. I'll give props where they actually did some things right. But there were some scenes in the original Grizzly that, that were cinematically were really good too. Yeah. Yeah, there were. There were. Uh, the next day, Chrissy confronts the lead singer of one of the bands who she's been having a good time with. To see if he's looking for something more serious with her. You know, he's just passing through, but they've been having some fun. I'm just a gypsy, a clown, a juggler. I go town to town and do my shows, and then I'm gone. It's all a game, a laugh, a joke. It's all a laugh. She a asks, joke. am I just a game, a laugh, and a joke to you? And he says, yes. Yes. At least he's honest. Unlike some of the musicians I hooked up with as a young groupie in the 80s. Thanks a lot, Guitar Tech from the Human League. Uh, I just shared something I probably shouldn't have. Uh, well, it answers some questions. 
me drink some more of this uh, therapy sauce. I'm not saying I haven't had that conversation. <laughs> uh, so it's finally the day of the big concert. We watch as hundreds of young folks dressed in all sorts of outstanding 1983 clothing arrive in droves as the girl band Toto Coelho takes the stage. So many mullets and jean jackets as far as the eye can see. My favorite dude they kept showing was this heavy metal teenager who looked like Napoleon Dynamite wearing a wasp t-shirt and spiked leather gloves. Did you see that guy? I, did. I, saw, I remember the wasp t-shirt. <laughs> Dude, yeah, lost t-shirt, spiked leather gloves. I think he might be a tad disappointed when he hears, <laughs> sees hears, Toto Colo or whatever. When he hears these bands that he's gonna hear. Oh no, no, no. He's there for that prog rock band, though. Over fifty. What guys. about the girl band though? You take the milk from the coconuts, milk from the coconuts, milk from the coconut. You take the milk from the coconut. What the fuck was that song? I don't know what that song was. But I sang it for like three days as I'm out in the yard getting attacked by redbirds. That's what I'm hearing in my head. Oh, my God. Milk from the coconuts. They were actually a real band. Toto Coelho. Uh, And they didn't know what the hell they were doing in Hungary either. They just flew them in. All these bands that you talk to, the opening bands, they all say the same thing. We were just doing small clubs in Europe and all this. And like all of a sudden we've got 40,000 kids watching us. Like this was the highlight of their career, Grizzly 2. And the fact that it never went anywhere for 35 years crushed them. They're telling their kids, I swear we played in front of 40,000 kids. It's, <laughs> I, I swear to God, we I sang in front of 40,000 Hungarian kids. Like, yeah, sure, Dad. Hey, now they get to actually show it. Well, like I said before, it is a sweet, sweet time capsule. It is. It's a really sweet time capsule, Yaks. And watching all these people pour into the concert really solidify that. There's even a shot. Did you guys see the shot of the two young moms carrying their babies into the concert with cigarettes hanging out of their mouths like the ashes <laughs> falling on the babies? It's so 80s. And they got the, the, the denim vest with the Metallica patches. Like, come on, dude. That was great. Uh, God, got to love the 80s. Uh, but leave it to Grizzly 2 to ruin it all by inserting drone footage over the parking lot of a modern day festival full of minivans and Priuses. Dude, it, it was such real. Like, dude, these... I'm, I'm buying all this shit they're showing me. All these great footage of women carrying their babies with cigarettes. The cigarettes are, the kids are smoking ba- cigarettes. It's crazy. Um, but then all of a sudden we have this drone shot going over a modern music festival with Priuses and minivans. And you're like, well, that those cars didn't exist in 1983. And then, oh, come on, Tut. That had to fucking jar your, no, okay. At this point, I'm just on a fun ride, and I'm riding it. Did they have Priuses in 1983? Because that's all I saw in that parking lot was minivans and Priuses. Why show that footage? You had all this great crowd footage pouring into this thing. Don't show us. We don't need new aerial It's bad editing. I think they just they ran out of footage, so they had to slap some stuff in there to try and get it up to an hour and ten minutes. That's Tut, did, Tut, did they have Drew Estate cigars back in 1983? Uh, no, I don't think they did. They did not. Drew Estate was founded over a decade later in 1995. And speaking of Drew Estate, let's talk about them for a hot minute. All right, let's do that. Crafted by level nine Cuban rollers at the famed El Titan de Bronze in Cale Oco, or Ocho. The Herrera Esteli Miami line is expertly rolled with a lavish Ecuadorian Habano Oscuro wrapper over a rich Ecuadorian Sumatran binder. I love that Sumatran binder. With select fillers from the Dominican Republic and Nicaragua, the new look of Herrera Esteli Miami features a rich black and gold packaging, and it's available in five sizes. 
I've smoked the cigar many times and is truly one of Willie Herrera's masterpieces. So jump in your car, your minivan, your Prius, you know, those vehicles we have nowadays, or jump online right now and get your hands on some. What are you waiting for? Do it now. We'll wait. We'll wait. Are we done waiting? Let us know when you've ordered the Herrera Stelly Miami, and we'll get back to our show. All right, we'll get back to it anyway. All right. Back out in the deep forest, Samantha wanders off from the men and is chased by a grizzly. Only when Bouchard shows up to a rescue and shoots it dead, she's super pissed because it was the wrong bear. They're hunting a female, and this much smaller bear was a male. She says that tra- the tranquilizer would have worked perfectly. It's just fine. But Bouchard doesn't care. Bouchard doesn't tranquilize. He tells her to leave the devil bear killing business to Bouchard. I, I like how much he refers to himself in the first person. I'd like a t-shirt that says Bouchard doesn't tranquilize. Bouchard doesn't <laughs> tranquilize. As night begins to fall, the, cra- <laughs> the crowd shots of the concert are truly impressive as hell. This was actually a major fucking music festival they pulled off in Hungary with 40,000 people in attendance. That's huge. I shot a movie early in my short-lived filmmaking career where I tried to get a a college campus rally together, and I had like 15 people show up. (laughs) Dude, 40,000 fuckers show up to this thing. We could have gotten Nazareth to play that college campus at TJC. I, 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 I think... In 2000, what was that? Five, I, I think Mario I was, messing with a son of a bitch. I think if I got Nazareth, we probably would have got about 15 people. Sorry. And they were careful not to film all the Soviet tanks and jeeps that were surrounding it. Because it was actually a Soviet train area, as I said. Hey, can you uh, move the uh, mic a little bit closer to you? Sure. Uh, Doctor, how... how in the history of Hungary, where was this in their takeover by the Soviets? Like two years, maybe? No, they've, they've been under Soviet occupation since the 50s. Yeah. That, that was was a, no, I'm sorry. That was my mic that screwed up. That's what I said. <laughs> it's, like a, it's like a 30-year occupation. At this point, pretty much. They're behind the Iron Curtain. They're, they're under Soviet-controlled Russia since about 1955 <laughs> or so. No, that's what I thought. Um, that's that's what I meant. I like it there, though. I don't think there's much of a redbird population. Well, it's good to have options. Oh, in in Soviet Hungary, there was a lot of red, just not red birds. No, I'm not. I'm not doing carbs right now, so I can't. I can't do bread. Um. Well, get this. There's also some tall private suites erected throughout the crowd where VIPs like Yak Boy and I were always VIPs, right, Yanks? Very immense penises, yes. These tall towers amongst the crowd are erected where VIPs like Superintendent Dragon and her senator friend can be served cocktails and enjoy the show in luxury. All right. So how could the Grizzly 2 filmmakers fuck this bit of impressiveness up? You may ask. By inserting a high-definition song performance by a modern band that are clearly playing on the stage of a fucking coffee house or a small pub and not in front of 40,000 horny Hungarians. I'm assuming that all the... Hungarians were horny back in 1983. I think you'll back me up on that, Doctor. They were. They were. All of a sudden, in the middle of this concert, we cut to some fucking lame ass pub band that is clearly shot in high definition nowadays. It it looks nothing like the other bands. Why did they do that? Oh my God! It was so bad. It was, but I just at this point I just loved it. They just it's they got so, some acoustic coffee house band doing doing aha covers. And just it's from so jarringly place. bad. It's almost as nonsensical and terrible as the crowd cutaway shots 
of the clearly modern teenagers filmed recently with the fake Afro wigs dancing around and loving everything, trying to recreate 1985. You think I guys in Afro wigs and, and shaved. It's like, dude, you just showed us 40,000 Hungarian heavy metal teenagers. There's no way. But dude, that modern band and dude, I know doctor, you say this a lot. We're not meant to dig into this film this far. This film we are and why the fuck when the bootleg cut of this movie ran 100 minutes and this shit runs 75 minutes would you film some cheap ass stupid ass fucking ska band in a coffee shop and expect us to believe that it's on this main stage when all the other main stage shit it looks like Muse in Germany. It looks like big time, like crazy U2 on stage. And you cut to these fucking amateur hour fucking hose noses. Oh, my God. dude! That, that was the worst thing of the thing for me was watching this stupid ass band play. Oh, right. Did not bother you guys. Actually, actually, it didn't. And the reason why I'm saying that is simply because I've seen it a few times in this film already. At this point, we're getting it ready into a, to go into a wild, wild sequence. I'm but on that, board. That, it's just it's, every other every other band had. It looked like Farm Aid with fucking Willie Nelson on stage with just. Amazing. Oh, I I under I understand that, but you know, I, at this time band, I'm just kind of like. No offense, Cody. You cut to a band on O'Brien's Irish pub stage in downtown Temple, Texas, and slice it into this film, and expect us to believe it? Fuck you! It's terrible. I don't. I don't know that Suzanne Nagy expected anyone to believe it. She just threw this together to get her seventy-five minutes. I think. Hey. I think the hundred-minute cut was just more of that Emerson, hey. Lake, and Palmer knockoff band of those sixty-year-old dudes. Hey, <laughs> it's just those sixty-year-old dudes for thirty she minutes. Had, she around. had to finish her memoirs. Oh, what a lucky man he was! What the shit? That stupid fucking bar band. I, I just couldn't believe it. Obviously, but, any money left did not go into editing. I, on this. That's how sad it was. I was like, "Please bring me that elderly prog band." <laughs> I miss them. Oh my god! Well, back out in the forest, the giant hole in the ground filled with spikes is finally dug. So a drunk Poppus and Steve. Oh Charlie yeah, Cy- back to Charlie these Cyphers, guys. Charlie Cypress and the uh, first blood guy. They should have I added got- more of these guys in there. I want a movie just with these guys. They're about to double cross the other two poachers and throw them in the pit to attract the bear when the fucking grizzly shows up and eats them all. They don't have time to double cross these guys. The the bear eats them all. We don't get to see any of it, of course. It's just a lot of growling screams. That's all we get. <laughs> Typical Saturday night at Jack Stewart's house. (laughs) Although when Bouchard (laughs) discovers their bodies later that night with his flashlight, you know because it's nighttime, remember that. They're all chewed up in good, gory, bloody effects. Their bellies are are opened up with guts spilling out. There's a dude like 20 feet up in the tree. Yeah, he's impaled like 20 feet up in the air in a tree. We then cut to a POV shot of the bear walking down a dirt road, breathing heavily towards the concert. Only, it's not a bear POV because it's clearly shot from the front of a car using headlights (laughs) to shine the way ahead. Which makes no fucking sense. Doctor, do bears have headlights? Well, (laughs) of course they don't, but upon that size, his eyes might glow in the dark. Not like headlights. Not like headlights. No. Clearly, it this is no a bear that has sense. eyes like, like headlights. Hey, we, we got to fill this <laughs> space. Let's drive a car down the road and film it, and that'll be the bear's POV with fucking headlights. I was still waiting for Jack Starrett to come back with his ripped open stomach. I just rubbed some dirt on it, soldier boy. 
you ain't gonna take care of me so easily, <laughs> God, Jay. And then we cut to more <sighs> grisly tracking footage of the bear going to the concert. And through the trees, it's clearly daylight, <laughs> even though it's the middle of the night of the concert. Again, you guys like to come to me. Kate, I don't think we should be dice. Dude, <laughs> it's nighttime and the bears shit shows daylight. We gotta talk about it. I could just see your I, I could just see your face if I had cut this and you'd just be like, What the fuck, dude? Really? Really? I mean, just slap a blue filter on it or something. Fucking t- crank down the gamma. Drop, knock that light out of there. Everything you're saying is true, of course. I just enjoyed it because of all of these things. It's that's crazy. that's true. That's true. It's crazy. It's nonsensical. And I want to know what she paid these editors three years ago to like. All right, you guys can bring this all together. <laughs> it was Proctor again. Exactly. Like, You've robbed me 28 times, but I'm going to pay you another $50,000 to edit this because I'm going to give you one last chance. All right. all right, Proctor. All right, I'll give you one more chance. I was about to say, maybe, who knows, in another 30 years, you're going to hear the editors on this say, man, we, we got paid in IOUs. All right. I just love the fact that after our last film where I got just a heaping load of I don't think we're supposed to think about these things. I don't think we're supposed to look at this movie this way. I don't think, dude, this movie is begging for us to talk about these things. The bear is marching with headlights towards the nighttime concert with daylight shining off its ass. Okay. Back on the main stage, Chrissy's love interest, who's now dressed like a character from Clash of the Titans, is performing with his band, The Predator as the festival's closing act. And, did you guys notice this? He's backed up by the Running Man Game Show dancers. <laughs> yes, I did. And they weren't as good as the Running Man Game Show dancers. That, I think that was they the, were the Hungarian version. Exactly. They were the Hungarian. They were the Soviet game. version of it. They tried. They tried. <laughs> the Grizzly shows up at the fence, the picket wooden fence bordering the concert area. And somehow the bear starts a fire. We don't see how it does that. Sending cases of fireworks exploding all over the place. Even setting some poor stagehand on fire. You see a guy who runs around for like 15 fire, minutes. But we don't know how that happened. Okay. It's literally like, oh, there's a dude on fire now. Okay. Nick and Samantha zoom in. And I mean, they super literally zoom in. The editor speeds up their Jeep to comical proportions screaming into the the concert site and it flips over on its side all of a sudden again no reason i thought they killed him and i was like okay that's a choice for some reason i know i'm saying that phrase a lot in this last paragraph but for some reason the grizzly can't get past that tiny little wooden fence so it just stands there and growls over and over again Bouchard em- emerges from the flames and shoots at the devil bear, but it has no effect. Nick commandeers a forklift and tries to ram the grizzly, but it just bear swats the forklift over on its side. Bear swat. <laughs> Bouchard then climbs some scaffolding and lassos his way onto the grizzly's back, stabbing it repeatedly with a knife. But even that just annoys the creature as it easily bear swats him away impaling him on the scaffolding. So Nick, our hero, in what might be the most anticlimactic, lazy, poorly executed final kill in creature feature history. But wait a minute. Before we go into this, are we not going to discuss the bear that looks like uh, Champ the Insult comic dog puppet? I mean, right. I was literally waiting for the bear to say, for me to poop on. We'll get to that. Okay. We'll get to that. So Nick lures the grizzly to chase him towards the back of the main stage of the bands where there are high voltage warning signs everywhere. But naturally, we don't get to see the grizzly move at all. We just cut to the bear's mouth, suddenly engulfed in flames. An identical shot to Jaws 2, 
when the shark bites down on the power cable in the ocean, and then the dead grizzly crashes through the walled lights behind the stage. The crowd goes nuts as both they and the VIPs all think it's part of the show. Well, except for Superintendent Dragon, who knows? She knows better. There was something else going on here. We hear the singer off screen say, thank you, thank you, everybody, to the roaring crowd, and that's it. The end. Okay. Dun, dun, dun. Tut. The guy who created Yoda and half of the cantina creatures in Star Wars made three bears for this movie. At every point in production, he was told, you will get a time when we fly back to America to showcase what you've done. Yak boy, you appreciate this. Guess what they use for fur on the bears? What? Yak hair. I'm out. I hate it. There was literally a scene, and I I I thought you'd like that. I understand that when this bear stands up, he's supposed to be sixteen feet, or she's supposed to be sixteen feet. The bear doesn't do anything. There's literally a scene where they look at it, and in the background, it looks like they had a wall that they threw some fur rug over and just moved towards the camera. When the chick producer that got us finally this movie to talk about, so I I want to give her props for that. She took it to producer Arnold Coppelson, a huge, giant producer in Hollywood in the 90s. Uh, Lethal Weapons, I think he did Arnold's Eraser. Big time producer. And he shut it. They went to a screening at his house and he shut it down halfway through. And he's like, how the hell can you sell a grizzly movie with no fucking grizzly? It's because this team made really good grizzlies and they burned up in that warehouse and hungry and nobody got to ever do anything with them so all you get in that final scene is the side profile of a grizzly bear growling it's terrible it's it, it's the most as i said the most anticlimactic creature feature ending the the hard part the hard part about all of this is that it it's looks easy. kind of angry but it's easy for me to shit on all of this stuff. But at the same time, I love the fact that I'm able to shit on it. I love the fact that they were able to put something together for me to poop on. I just, I respect the fuck out of this story. I respect the hell out of this film simply because of that story. I mean, it's it's a hard thing to do because I, I, on one hand, I just want to rip it apart. But on the other hand, I kind of just love the whole concept of it it barely barely barely. (laughs) it it almost doesn't count as a movie they didn't finish it and yeah the stuff that the interspersed stuff shot a year ago with the 83 stuff it's ludicrous but it's really barely a movie I, I just, it, when I first, when I watched it and I told Cade to watch it and I, I just said, I don't know what you're going to think about this, but I just looked at it. It's crazy. It's silly. She slapped it together. There, there, uh, obviously there's some stuff they could have done in post. Like you said, Cade, that, that would have made a little bit more, made things a little less silly. I appreciate it for its silliness. What I liked about this was I watched what we have, the 74 minute cut. And I just think I wish that they had not been robbed. I wish that they'd had the budget to film the entire thing. I wish that the Russian army hadn't stolen their bears or burned them down and they could have done all that stuff with the bears, done a proper post with everything. It could have been great. Been a 90 minute fully completed movie with the budget as they intended it probably would be a classic that we've been talking about for the last 30 years but that's just not what happened right it it probably would have surpassed the original it had the potential because you know there's more stuff of charlie cyphers and star running around the woods you know it would have sounded better 
It would have looked better. One can only imagine what the Star Wars guy, what his bears would have looked like if they had been able to incorporate that. It could have been fantastic, but really it just was not a finished movie. They couldn't ever finish it. They couldn't ever shoot some of the penultimate scenes and they couldn't do a proper post on it. Well, I agree uh, with everything you said, Doctor. And Suzanne Nagy, I hope I'm saying that correctly. She's Hungarian, so Nagy or Might be Nagy, who knows? Nagy, whatever. Uh, to have that kind of tenacity to fucking bring this at, to some kind of fruition after 30 some odd years, I respect the hell out of that. Uh, we've actually, uh, over our 131 episodes there's been a lot of episodes where you people at home don't know but we had to piece them back together uh tuttle and cody got so fucked up that we had to go back and like jump back into the middle of an episode and and keep filming it (laughs) or you know you guys were so out of control at the end of it like it was it was uh, it was us. It was totally us. There I was an episode where you got drunk on Golden Monkey and attacked Tut with a beer bottle. That, didn't you just cut that out and put in like twenty minutes of that dinner for five with Kevin Smith and John Favreau? Just a just similar to this movie. Hey, like Suzanne Nagy, we find creative ways to to keep the show rolling. But I mean, there's been a lot of shows here where we creatively. Uh, you guys at home would never know it. We uh, we filmed a show and then we filmed. We, we it, later on we, we made that show work uh, because of Tut and Yak's antics and red bird interference. Lots of red bird interference. Um, but yeah, I, I just I love the story of this film. I I love the persistence of the producer to get this thing out i i i think it, it it man it's admirable it's like you could have just gone to bed and let this part of your past die as uh, a quiet death and you didn't and even though the end result sucks as far as creek to creek, even though it's lazy filmmaking and even though you went like with some really stupid choices Sorry, you did. You, you actually, you actually could have made this a lot better with very minimal effort, if I'm being honest. But this is what you did, and I'm going to give you kind of credit for it. <laughs> and I, I still, <laughs> she could have, she could have just done a few little things, and it would have been so much better. But you know what? Now you can write. Now you can write your memoirs. Uh, I don't know. When you say she could have done a few things, I don't know. When you say it could have been so much better, I disagree with that. She could have been a hell of a lot better. If she just made the the, uh, no. the footage she put in there look a little bit more like the old footage, if she could just maybe found a way to make that whatever that missing 20 minutes of footage that the the bootleg cut was 100 minutes, figure out some way to do that dude she could she could she could have manipulated this shit a lot better than she did but having said that it's out there and now we can pay money to see it we all paid our five bucks or whatever but dude come on no tiny tiny things could have made this thing so much better not so much better I've, i've paid five bucks for a lot worse you're saying so much better. There's a few. We don't know what was in that hundred minute cut. That, that could have just been more of the band footage, which would have just been boring. Yeah. Yes, there are some. Dude, there, was, there was nothing about that band footage that was boring. <laughs> if there was twenty more minutes of it, yes. <laughs> well, maybe so. Yeah, yeah, I agree with the doc on like, that. Like, when you're sitting there going, "Come on, it could have been so much better." Uh, that's a stretch. Here's an extra ten. Here's an extra ten minutes of those fifty-year-old prog rockers. You take the milk. You're, you're making it sound like nuts. you're so much better, far better. No, I, 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 I can't agree with that. All right, all right, doctor, you, you got me on that one. Okay, I'll give it to you. But uh, all her faults aside, she did what she felt she had to do, and I'm glad we got a chance to talk about it. Is that fair? 
That's fair. Very much so. Is it, like fair it. That, is it fair that the most pain that I have is just wondering what the really finished thing would have been? If they've been able to have the budget and do it. Me too. Way. Me too, Doc. Because with with the cy- with those poachers, the ciphers, and the first blood guy, and dude, I just can't help but think, like, if they had the money to do what they wanted to do, especially with the fucking guy who invented Yoda... We could only that, imagine. We, we could have had some revolutionary bear effects, and he never, he never got, he never got to showcase that. All we got was a bear growling, a guy screaming, cut, and even dude, the deputy Pete, park ranger Pete, he he died in a cave, the bear chasing the cave, and when he screamed. It was clearly there was sunlight outside. Like he wasn't even in the same. He wasn't even a cave. Like, dude, they did the best they could with the resources available to them at the time. Yeah, I mean that's what makes it interesting. That make, that's what makes it interesting to watch. That's what makes it interesting to talk about. I just and I thought I it. thought that's why we should uh, delve into this thing because man, it it is an anomaly. That that is a true statement. So, uh, who knows where we'll go next time, boys. But uh, in the meantime, Oscar, the Wild Hunter Cigar, I'm going to give it a half give, thumbs no, I'm going to give it a full thumbs up. I'm going to go ahead and give it a full thumbs up. For what it was want, wanting to be, it provided. There if that's what it wanted to be, we don't know. Well, I'm still going to give it a thumbs up. Okay, two thumbs up. Well, whatever like one Oscar, be, it was tasty. I'm gonna stick. I like Oscar, so I'll, I'll, I'll join you, boys. Uh, I think y'all's uh, full-grown bearded woodsman beer stout really paired well, way above my IPA with the cigar. Uh, I think I think the the maple. Yes. I think everything that you guys were getting out of the beer just complimented the hell of that cigar. Um. I did not have that. My beard just stayed the hell out of its way, and um, but it was good. I highly recommend the Imperial IPA from wow. Booty Ranger. Doctor, you like your Booty Ranger too? Yeah, that's a good beer. Uh, like you guys talked about it, five percent, thirty IBUs, pretty easy. It's a good, smooth IPA. All right, Tut, give us some links. All right, so you want to join us on Twitter at TNCCCast. You want to hit us up on Instagram, which is getting a lot of love, at TNCC underscore podcast. You can join us on Facebook, Tuesday Night Scar Club. But please, please, please subscribe to us, James Brown style, uh, the singer James Brown style. Please, please, please. uh, YouTube at Tuesday Night Cigar Club. You can see all of our live footage where we shoot it. Then you can see the actual edited show. Uh, It's always good. If you want to uh, buy yourself, uh, buy your loved one a little bit of Valentine's gift because it's coming up around the corner, uh, you can go to Tuesday Night Cigar Club, hit the Amazon banner, do your shopping from there. It helps us keep the lights on. And if you want to buy the... uh, Oscar cigar that you had tonight or any of other little cigars that you want to go on there, the Drew Estate Herrera Esteli, you can go to Tuesday Night Cigar Club, click on the Famous Smoke Shop banner. It's going to automatically input the code TNCC20 if you buy 100 bucks worth of cigars. It's going to knock $20 off of that, and that's a damn good deal. Boys, uh, I thought we'd had fun with this one, and I think we did. So, uh, you guys i enjoyed it i had i had fun with this it, it was a it was a it was a weird odd duckling of a movie and i i i had fun i loved hearing your guys stories about the frightmare again those are always fun i like to hearing the stories about the background of this movie this kind of cool yeah. hearing hearing how it all came together this it dude t- you're right this is this is an ugly duckling of a movie and I think that's why I gravitated towards it because we are an ugly duckling of a podcast. Uh, We're kind of, we're kind of an oddball. And I, I like oddballs. I like nonsensical numb nuts like ourselves who you got to really dig in to make sense of what we're doing. May the wings of Liberty never lose a feather.
Sayonara, motherfuckers. To learn more about the time I discovered that a bear does indeed do more than just shitting in the woods, you can watch my nature documentary titled Grizzly 3, The Big Brown Orgy. You see, I was minding my own business one day in the forest while foraging for huckleberries when I came across an incredibly horny sleuth of bears doing the nasty. There was honey involved and all sorts of other sticky substances. If a bear climaxes in the woods and no one is around to hear it, does he or she really make a sound? Well, I wouldn't know, ladies and gents, because I grabbed my trusty camera and my bucket of huckleberries and got the hell out of there. And yes, a group of bears is called a sleuth. But I was the real sleuth that day. Unfortunately, I'll never be able to look at Winnie the Pooh the same. What a pervert. Anywho, while you're searching online for the documentary that the snooty dweebs over at National Geographic called the most disturbing and furriest piece of shaky footage we have ever seen, you can learn more about the cigars enjoyed on tonight's episode by visiting www.oscartobacco.com. For more on O'Brien's Irish Pub, the live music leader in Central Texas, please visit O'Brien'sTemple.com and download their free smartphone app where you'll find full beer listings including over 40 on tap, menu information, and a calendar of upcoming live events. To listen and purchase music heard on tonight's program, check out www.fritzbeermusic.com. Thank you for listening to the Tuesday Night Cigar Club podcast. This is Keith A. Howell saying, until next time, friends, unless we see you sooner at the pub. So keep it smoky, and for God's sake, keep it ballsy as well.